from home echoes across Havana from the time people line up to buy their tickets for two pesos, nine cents, as much as five hours before game time. This was only the semi-final of their championship series, proof that while the government reminds us sport may be the right of the people, baseball is the soul of those people. The people in Cuba is a, a crazy baseball fan, all the people in the Cuba, all the people was managing, all the people is prior, all the people is uh, a, a, a baseball fan. This is really a celebration of the sort of cultural bonds that we have in these two countries that are represented by baseball. Even throwing the ball around the infield is a ritual, as are the smallest nuances. Parents don't have to spend $22 a head on concessions. They remain in their seats, jamming for three hours, under the watch of ushers who are also policemen. There are no souvenirs, no scorebooks on sale, but there are a couple of concession stands, dollars required for the big ticket items like colas from trash barrels. Vendors offer Cuban sandwiches, pork rinds, milk sugar bars from a shoebox, and the stadium staple, coffee served in paper thimbles. There are signs of Americanization, but this is the Cuban game that's been played here for nearly a century and a quarter, where even the umpires are treated well. In Japan, you know, crowds are very sedate except with uh, some organized cheering. In the United States, I think it's, it's uh, somewhere in the middle. But uh, certainly what I've seen in other uh, Caribbean countries, in the Dominican Republic, in a playoff game, is you know, a tremendous uh, enthusiasm and uh, excitement and a tremendous, tremendous amount of pride uh, that gets reflected in the, in the crowd. The Cuban team had been a mystery right up to 24 hours before game time, practicing under guard in the nearby village of San Jose. With the exception of one player, none of the players from the final four teams were selected, so the Orioles will not see the great shortstop, Herman Mesa. But neither the press or people knew that for certain until yesterday. News of American baseball, especially the El Duque's and Orlando Arrojos who have defected to it, is not allowed. But many fans know about these Orioles. They know a lot. <laughs> they know a lot. Uh, do you know how, but the people know <laughs> a lot about about the, the Major Leagues, how they play, how they, they behave there. And they know the Baltimore Orioles, they know Albert Bell, they know Cal Ricken, they know Musina. And they are excited about seeing them. We have been waiting for this opportunity for many years because we have won all the, the amateur tournaments in the world in the last 20 years, I say, and then we have been looking, looking after to, to play with, with the Major League team to see really where are our players. Wooden bats, which hadn't been used in 22 years, are a hot topic. In the first 13 playoff games, there was one home run, and offense was meager. They will use Cuban umpires and Cuban baseballs. Cuban baseballs are a little less lively than uh, U.S. balls. We'll see whether that's the case. But um, when you put wood bats together with uh, less lively balls, we may, we may have a very different kind of game on Sunday. Their fans believe that their major leaguers are the equal of those in the Orioles League. So Cuba can win. I think that the people believe that we can, we can win the game or we can make, it, make a, good, a, good, a, good, a good game. Very interesting piece. And Peter Gammons now joins us from Havana. Peter, are the real fans going to be able to get into this game? Well, not really, because it's under distribution. But I'll say one thing. I'm standing here listening to fans who are not supposed to be the real fans going nuts over the Orioles taking, taking batting practice. So that's a great thing. And they have distributed between five and 8,000 tickets to people in this neighborhood who are all fanatical baseball fans. But basically, tickets have been given out to party faithful and for, as rewards rather than the type of crowds that we get in the playoff games. Yes, that would be the uh, Communist Party of Fidel Castro, of course, to which you refer. Uh, what has player reaction been to what has become a bit of a political football? That's well, interesting. A lot of the players have been really hit with this. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Omar Linares was asked a lot of questions. And basically, you know, his response to the Cuban players now in the United States was, hey, you know, we are Cuban players raised under the system to play under the system. They had their formation under this system. They should be very happy they were here. B.J. Surhoff's answer was, hey, we're baseball players playing in a baseball game. We'll let historians write history and people like us read about it. I don't think the players want to get involved in it very much. And, you know, when, like, when Delano De Shields went around and saw some of the kids around and Lenny Webster was talking about it today, hey, you know, there's a point where the politics stop 
and it's pure baseball. We all know that the money goes just to those places, just like back in the United States. You think the average fan is able to go to the All-Star Game of the World Series? Of course not. So, I mean, there are a lot of similarities, but the players just want to play baseball, and the bonding between the players has been very interesting. Yes, especially this year at Cozy Fenway Park, where tickets will be at a premium. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this Cuban team. Last year was the year of the home run in Major League Baseball. We're going to see a bit of a different style, at least we anticipate one, don't we? Well, you know, first of all, this is not the best Cuban team. I mean, I understand that they're, the, the, play, the teams in the playoffs don't have their players, so we're not seeing Herman Mesa, we're not seeing Orestes Kindlin, we're not seeing players like that. And because they've been trying to get used to wooden bats for the last three weeks, and they're using the Cuban baseballs, which are a little bit deader, and they kind of know now that they're facing Erickson and Timlin, two of the greatest sinker ballers in, in the world, that, you know, they're going to play a speed game. They have three or four guys that can really run. They just have two or three of their big hitters in the middle of the lineup. The second baseman, Dwayne Yas, is somebody to watch. He's a great player, would play anywhere in the States. But they're going to try to play a speed game, take advantage of the Orioles sort of battered up infield right now, and try to steal the game. Meeting the Orioles before the game. Cuba, where baseball is not a national pastime, but a national passion for all ages. For generations, this island nation produced a parade of stars, many in the major leagues. Then in 1959, Castro's Revolution, since which the top Cuban players have only opposed American amateurs on an international stage dominated by Cuban talent for decades. A handful have made a perilous escape from Castro's oppressive regime to glory in the majors. In Castro's Cuba, Major League Baseball has not been seen. A 40-year absence that ends today in Havana. Fifty-five thousand close personal friends of Fidel. It's invitation only today at Latino Americano Stadium. And they're all here as Major League Baseball is back to Cuba for the first time since 1959. The Baltimore Orioles meeting some of the best stars from Cuba. And we're here high up above the field itself beneath the rooftop. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan. And Joe, they told us it was supposed to be about baseball, about a baseball exchange, but obviously it became by invitation only. Fidel then made his grand entrance and the 55,000 invitees all chanted his name. So, so far, it's been very much about Fidel. We'll see about the ball game itself. For the Orioles, they're taking this very seriously. Ray Miller wants the Orioles to show that they have the best baseball in the major leagues, and he very much wants to win this ball game, so they'll play it more like a regular season game. Is it possible that this Cuban ball club could beat the mighty Orioles from the major leagues? Well, of course it is, John. That's the great thing about baseball. On any given day, anyone can win. I think in order for the Cuban team to win, it has to be a low-scoring ball game. Their pitchers have proved that they can beat the American League and the National League hitters. That's been proven by El Duque and Levon Hernandez. So they are capable of holding an American League team down. Now they're at a disadvantage offensively because they have to adjust to the wooden bat. They've played with an aluminum bat for 22 years and now for the last three weeks they've had to adjust to a wooden bat and going against Scott Erickson that doesn't bode well for them. So they'll have to win a low scoring ball game. The Orioles would win any slugfest. All right Albert Bell put on a show during batting practice. The Orioles the major leagues back in Cuba will have the festivities more comments from Cuba momentarily. Let's get going. Okay, there is no time to lose. I'm the Havana Sugar Kings. Played the Los Angeles Dodgers, who had a, a young left-hander who pitched that day by the name of Sandy Koufax. We're awaiting the historic ceremonies. The uh, flags of the two nations will be brought out by representatives from each ball club with their uh, teammates following. That's B.J. Serhoff bringing out the stars and stripes. And Omar Linares, the, the greatest player in the, the revolutionary era of Cuban baseball, Martin Vigo, who also was a star in the, 
the old Negro Leagues in the United States is uh, by the old timers accounts the greatest player who ever lived from Cuba. And the national anthems of the two nations will soon be performed. And Ray Miller, his coaching staff, Eddie Murray, now a coach for the Orioles, Richie Bansells, the trainer who, whose family comes from Cuba. National anthems of the United States, the Star Spangled Banner, and of Cuba. And now the two ball clubs are going to be introduced a la the first game of the World Series. The Orioles are being introduced now. Let's uh, pick up the introductions from the stadium announcer here at Latino Americano Stadium in Havana. Catcher, the line of the Chills, infielder. Dave Evans, right-handed pitcher. Mike Feathers, right-handed pitcher. Jesse Garcia, infielder. Gary Hairston, Jr., infielder. Chris Hoyles, catcher. Doug Jones, left-handed pitcher. Charlie Johnson, catcher. Scott Kamineki, right-handed pitcher. Doc Linton, right-handed pitcher. Lyle Moulton, outfielder. Mike Murphy, outfielder. Mike Mussina, right-handed pitcher. Jesse Orozco, left-handed pitcher. Willis Sultanis, infielder. Sidney Parson, right-handed pitcher. Arthur Rhodes, left-handed pitcher. Jeff Reboulet, infielder. Heathcliff Slocum, right-handed pitcher. Mike Timblin, right-handed pitcher. Julio Reyes, catcher. And Lenny Webster, catcher. For el equipo de Charles Cuba. Johnson was down in the Oriole bullpen Manager, area. That's why he was not there Viola. at that time. Asistentes Danilo Valiente, Ulises Jardines, Pedro Perez, Benito Camacho. Coaching staff Jugadores for the Cuban team. De cuadro Andy Morales, Daniel Castro, Eduardo Cárdenas, Enrique Díaz, Loidel Chapelli, Michelle Abreu, 
Omar Linares, Joval Dueñas, Juan Carlos Moreno, Jardinero, Robert Ismidó, Daniel Lazo, José Estrada, Luis Ulacia, Receptores, Juan Manrique, Robert Machado, Lanzadores, José A. Contreras, Giovanni Aragón, Ernesto Guevara Ramos, Ciro Silvino Licea, Lanzador Zurdo Lázaro Carlos, Lanzador Derecho Pedro Luis Lazo. They are not introducing the, uh, the lineups per se, they're introducing the entire squads uh, who are here for the two ball clubs today. And although the Orioles have more than 30 players in uniform here, by agreement, only 25 are eligible for this game. And uh, Scott Erickson, the Orioles starter and uh, uh, a longtime major leaguer with a great hard sinker, will get the start for the Orioles and could go as many as eight innings if he uh, does not have too high a pitch count. Ray Miller said he will not hesitate to do that because he wants to, to play this game to win. Well, I don't think there's any doubt about how you should play the game. Whether they will continue that after the game starts is another story, but I think you have to. I mean, they're representing the major league, not just, you know, the United States, but they're representing the major leagues. And therefore, they owe it to their other major league compadres to win this ball game if they can. And uh, Alvaro Martin, who is here with us from our baseball international coverage, talked to the Cuban manager. This man to my right has won eight championships in nine years as a manager, Alfonso Urquiola. Alfonso, what are you going to do today? You have not seen the Baltimore Orioles. Tú no has visto los Orioles antes. ¿Qué tú has visto de este equipo? Eh, sí, bueno, hemos visto algunos videos. Eh, hemos visto sobre todo los lanzadores. Eh, hemos visto, bueno, en general, eh, algunos videos de este equipo. He has seen some videos, especially of the pitchers, especially of Erickson. ¿Cómo prepara su equipo para este encuentro? ¿Cómo lo prepara y qué tipo de estrategia va a utilizar? What strategy are you using for this game? Bueno, nosotros siempre que preparamos un equipo, lo preparamos eh, pensando siempre que lleguen a óptima forma a la competencia. Eh, la estrategia nuestra, bueno, la táctica, nosotros, tú sabes que hemos sufrido eh, el cambio de bate de aluminio hacia la madera. O sea que esto nos obliga un poco, como es muy reciente el cambio, nos obliga a cambiar un poco la estrategia ¿no? eh, que teníamos. Nosotros prácticamente nos basamos en el juego dinámico, en el juego más rápido. O sea que es la táctica que tenemos que utilizar eh, en compensación ¿no? de la fuerza, aunque tenemos jugadores de fuerza también, todo el mundo sabe que el bebé cubano es un bebé de bastante fuerza también, pero bueno, yo pienso que el bebé moderno es muy importante la rapidez. He says that they're going to, because of the use of the wooden bat, the strategy is going to have to change. They'll stress speed, they'll play small ball the way, and of course, they'll try to beat the Baltimore Orioles. Back to the booth. All right. Seemed like he said a lot more than that, but I'm glad that Alvaro Martin was able to uh, condense that down for us. And Alvaro Martin, who is a baseball commentator for ESPN International, and we're happy to have him with us today. We'll be uh, hearing from Alvaro uh, throughout the afternoon. Ray Miller. A meeting at home plate with the umpires. It's a six-man all-Cuban umpiring crew. And the manager, Alfonso Urquiola, from whom we just heard, and a couple of his coaches also meeting out there. Here's the umpiring alignment. Uh, Nelson Diaz, who uh, by uh, many accounts is the most respected umpire in Cuban baseball, will be behind at home plate. Cesar Valdez at first, Kerman Aguila at second, Raul Hernandez at third. The left field umpire Omar Lucero, the right field umpire Javier Rodriguez. And uh, the major league umpires were asked to come and uh, they declined. And so Major League Baseball said, well, we'll use the Cuban umpires instead. But, yeah, but John, you know, in defense of the um, American umpires, there are a lot of other things going on right now between them and Major League Baseball. And I'm sure that had a lot to do with their decision to come down. Of course, there are some umpires who felt that they didn't want to be involved in this game. Politics again. Yeah. Rearing its ugly head as we uh, get ready for this ball game. The Baltimore Orioles, of course, in spring training here in Cuba. The situation is absolutely the reverse. The Orioles, who are looking forward to opening day a week from tomorrow at home and the final stages of the spring exhibition schedule. Meanwhile, here in Cuba, their version of the World Series has just begun.
Industriales and uh, Santiago de Cuba, the two finalists from the Cuban League, have already played the first two games of their best of seven series. And none of the stars from those two teams is on this Cuban All-Star team today because of that involvement in the, the final playoff series of the Cuban League. The, the Cuban All-Stars have taken the field. The pitcher for Cuba today will be Jose Ibar, a veteran, a right-hander, and uh, he has uh, had a, a great couple of seasons. He was 18 and 2 during the, the regular season, and they play a 90-game schedule, so that's pretty impressive to win 18 games in only a 90-game schedule, which Ibar did, and uh, which, on, which only throws hard, has excellent control, and also throws a hard knuckleball, so we're anxious to see him. Well, he also is the only Cuban pitcher to ever win 20 ball games. He won 20 ball games in a season last year, so he's been excellent as far as wins are concerned. You see his numbers. He had 12 complete games during the season. And uh, he led the league in strikeouts with 158 in his 193 innings pitched. The Orioles with the lineup presented by manager Ray Miller. And let's take a look now. Brady Anderson who had 50 home runs a couple of years ago in center field. Mike Bordick at short. Will Clark at first base. Albert Bell in right field both of them Clark and Bell newcomers B.J. Surhoff in left uh, old reliable Harold Baines the D.H. Willis Otanias in place of Cal Ripken who uh, was not able to be here because of the death of his father Cal Ripken senior he is home for the, uh, the funeral and to be with his mother and family and we send our best wishes to Cal and the Ripken family Charles Johnson the catcher Jeff Rebelay at second hitting ninth the pitcher is Scott Erickson. This is a former major league pitcher with the Washington Senators, Conrado Marrero, who was known in the States as Connie Marrero, and uh, a legendary figure here in Cuba who taught the game at the Sports Institute. And he didn't want to just throw out one pitch, Joe. He's, he's warming up. I think, I think he's excited. 84. Ebar told him to move up to the front. He said, no, I can reach from here. Yeah. Yeah, he usually completed his games here in Cuba when he pitched here, so maybe he wants to go the distance, Joe. One is not a, he wants a batter up there. He wants Brady Anderson is coming to the plate. He, he, he signaled over to Brady. So let's get a hitter up there. So Connie Marrero used to pitch at old Griffith Stadium in Washington. Delivers a pitch to a major leaguer for the first time in over 40 years. I think he's gonna strike him out. He wants to stay there until he strikes him out. Or until he throws the strike. The umpire. A little different than the ceremony of first, first pitch in, <laughs> in America. I, I can't believe you, Brady. He tried to bunt on an 84 year old pitcher. <laughs> I'm going to have to get on Brady about that. I think Marrero wanted him to swing. I, I think Brady was a little <laughs> nervous about it if he swung. If he hit the ball back to the mound, it could be an international incident. Conrado Marrero, who for many years has taught baseball at the uh, the Sports Institute. In fact, Osvaldo Fernandez from Cuba, now in the San Francisco Giants organization, recovering from injury, uh, said that he himself, as a, a teenager, was taught by Conrado Marrero. Now the Cuban defense looks like this in the outfield. It is. Uh, Ulacia in left, Estrada in center, Bido in right, uh, Chapayi at first, Duenas at second, Moreno at short, Linares, the legendary one at third, and Manrique is the catcher on the mound, is the right hander, Jose Ibar. And now Brady Anderson, 50 homers as recently as 1996, coming back from an injury plague season and a very poor season last year. It's a trimmer version of Brady. First ball swinging, and Bido. Typical Brady Anderson against a pitcher that he's never seen and none of his teammates have ever seen. He swings at the first pitch. Thanks a lot, Brady. Ebar's nickname is Cheo, and he's 42 and 4, including the playoffs the last couple of years. So he is undoubtedly the number one pitcher here in Cuba as far as wins and losses are concerned. They say there are a couple of pitchers who have better stuff, and we may see a couple of them today. Here's Mike Bordick having an outstanding spring for Baltimore. Pretty good sinker over the outside corner, 85 miles an hour. That's that's an average 
sinker and not nothing overpowering not too slow just about average. Bordick was hitting uh, quite a few long balls during batting practice. And he is not a, a long ball hitter and the ball was not carrying particularly well in batting practice except when Albert Bell was swinging the wind was blowing in we were using the Cuban League Baseball and not the uh, official Major League Baseball for this game and that uh, breaking ball misses down and away one ball once for that now that might have been that hard enough that they were talking about there's the wind and it, it is blowing as you see it from the center field the flags in from right and across toward left well, that definitely had to be a knuckle and missed badly high and tight well, the one thing they say about e bar is that he reminds a lot of people of Louis Tion in that he throws from a lot of different angles throws a lot of different speeds with his pitches and he mixes in the knuckler two balls and a strike over the outside corner and that's what he does best they say spot his pitches very good on the outside corner moves the ball around and changes speeds well one of the other top Cuban pitchers Jose Contreras is already warming up in the bullpen for Cuba as this game starts full count now three and two there was speculation that each one of these pitchers may go two innings you know, and, and try to stay close, but they've already started to warm up. Maybe it's just going to take us take a long time as you see Contreras warming up in the bullpen. Both of them ordinarily starting pitchers. Uh, manager Urquiola in the dugout. Three and two to Mike Bordick. The Orioles' power comes up next. Will Clark on deck. One out, nobody on. He blew the fastball by. Him. Well, that's the best fastball he's thrown. In this ball game, it was upstairs, which is one of the ways that he's able to get hitters out because his fastball is not that overpowering, but up and out of the strike zone with two strikes. Good job of pitching here. This is the high fastball, and a lot of guys will chase this pitch with two strikes. And you see Bordick goes upstairs and doesn't catch up with it. So two down, nobody on, and Will Clark. I mean, when you make comparisons baseball and really almost any other sport one thing that is the great equalizer in baseball is pitching Will Clark takes a strike and whereas when the NBA All-Stars would play other teams from around the world it was always a mismatch in baseball a superior team can be beaten by an excellent pitcher and the Orioles of course have that the, the main disadvantage they had today they have not seen Ebo. So we'll see Ball, or one strike rather to Will Clark. His uh, first year with the Orioles with Texas the last five years. He in, in effect was traded for Rafael Palmero who went back to Texas and Clark comes to Baltimore. It's too hot. Well, the one thing Will Clark normally does and he's already started that way he took a strike he will make a pitcher work. And one thing you have to remember these these are major league hitters. They should be able to make adjustments to Ebar. They're watching him from the dugout right now watching how much his fastball moves how much his breaking ball breaks and then they will have an idea. I mean obviously the first inning as you see Will Clark made a gesture to his teammates that that was the knuckleball. And so they're all communicating and that's what major league hitters are supposed to do. They will make adjustments and you can see it is the knuckleball you see the grip there as he releases it wide but Will Clark turned to his teammates and said that was a knuckleball. Two balls one strike to Will Clark Albert Bell would be next Clark getting in the third spot which for many years in Baltimore was manned exclusively by Cal Ripken. There's ball three and uh, Cal Ripken is not here we certainly again send all, all of our condolences our sympathies and our best wishes and prayers to Cal his brother Bill his mother via Ripken as Cal Ripken senior an Oriole fixture for nearly 40 years passed away earlier this week and his ball four to Will Clark and the Orioles are wearing that number seven in memory and in tribute to Cal Ripken senior who taught Oriole players and future Oriole coaches and managers for many years the Oriole way of playing the game.
Ray Miller himself said, hey, he was the guy. Everything I know about the game was taught to me by Cal Ripken Sr. Will Clark with the walk. And one thing for sure in the regular season, it will never be a very good idea with two down and nobody on to walk Will Clark to get to this man. I think Albert Bell had the best reception of any of the Orioles players because they liked the fact that he's a slugger. And during batting practice, he had a lot of balls out of the ballpark, and they couldn't wait for him to get back in the batter's box each time. Ball one up and in. As a, a, a hard time. I don't know if that's a, a hard knuckler or not, but he's having a hard time controlling it. No, that was a fastball. Albert Bell with 49 home runs last year, and he launched some uh, mammoth shots during batting practice. And after one particularly potent round of BP, he stepped out of the cage and got an ovation from the crowd here at Latino Americano Stadium, and he waved. He acknowledged the, the roar of the crowd. One slugger to another, Linares to second, Duenas covering, forcing Will Clark. The Orioles do not score. Scott Erickson to take the hill against Cuba. The Paris concert for Amnesty International, premiering Saturday, April 3rd. Making a return after a 40-year absence. And uh, inside, the huge crowd, but by invitation only. And the, the baseball fans of Cuba, and it seems that everybody's a baseball fan here. There's a, a, a tremendous passion for the game. But uh, they, were learn, they were able to learn on Friday that they were, many of them, most of them, being excluded from attending this game. Jose Estrada in center field. Luis Ulasia in left field. Yoval Duenas at second base. The, uh, the great Omar Linares at third base. Injured most of this year, however. Andy Morales, the DH, hitting fifth. Loidel Chapelli at first base. Roberquis Vidó in right field, hitting seventh. Juan Manrique, the catcher. And uh, Juan C. Moreno at shortstop, batting ninth. Here in Cuba as well, as in the American League. And Major League Baseball, they use the designated hitter, but not to follow the, the U.S. lead on that, but because uh, it came into play in international play. Scott Erickson, a 16 game winner for the Orioles last year, a workhorse, 251 in the third innings pitch. And when he's right, Joey throws real hard, and it's probably the closest in the American League to a, a Kevin Brown type pitcher. Here is Estrada, right handed hitter. Ball one down and away. Estrada hit 320. Nine homers, 36 RBIs, and 14 steals. Two and up. Over at third base, Otanias in place of Cal Ripken, very shallow. Showing bunt, but taking high. He's just got a three and over the count. Well, the one thing that the Cubans would like to do is get on base and try to test Erickson, although they've got Charles Johnson, one of the best throwing catchers in baseball, behind the plate. And he pours that one through there for a strike. Three and one. There you see Charles Johnson. He usually stops most of the running games for the opposing teams. And it's a leadoff walk to Estrada. For the Orioles on the field, Sir Hoffman left, Anderson in center, Bell in right, Clark at first, Rebele at second, Bordick at short, Ortanius at third, Charles Johnson the catcher. And we'll see if he gets tested right away. One thing is almost a given Luis Ulasia, the best butter in Cuba, they say, is very likely to try and move him over with a butt right here. Well, they play fundamental baseball because they do not have a lot of power. So, in a normal situation, your second place hitter would try to sacrifice and advance the runner. In this type of situation, no sign of the bunt there. It takes ball one. I think they changed it to a strike. All right. I missed. I missed the hand signal That's there. Your first bad call of the year. Stop on I thought it was a ball. <laughs> Three oh six average during the, uh, the Cuban League season. Back to the bag at first is Estrada. Now, although Charles Johnson is a weapon against base stealing behind the plate, 
Scott Erickson will be a challenge to the best throwing catcher because he has had the, the worst ability to hold would be base dealers on base. One thing I'm told is Urquiola, the manager, is more conservative in the early innings anyway. He doesn't like to steal a lot. He would sacrifice more than steal in the situation, but we'll see how he plays it today. Well, he's trying to spread the hands apart there, but he took too high. Two balls and one strike to Ulasia. Yobal Duenas is on deck. There goes the run. And that's a foul. A little hit and run action there on two and one. Not a perfect time to do it. Two balls and one strike. Erickson's main concern is to throw a strike. So he's going to get a ball around the plate. At least he thinks so. Look at Urquiola. Well, he doesn't have a great jump off of Erickson. All he's doing is, you know, running on a hit and run. But you could see that big leg kick for Erickson. I mean, he does not go in for that slide step or quicken up his delivery to try and thwart the base stealing game. No score, last of the first. The Orioles went down quickly without a hit against Ivar. Estrada drew a leadoff walk here. And that is a foul right past the first base coach, Ulises Jardines. Two and two the count. Joe and I had the great pleasure to be here last night for game two of the final series of the season. Industriales from Havana, the, uh, the great team here in the last 40 years, playing uh, Santiago de Cuba. Serie de Baseball. Base hit right center field. Albert Bell cuts it off, heading for second. Ulacia. Out! Stopping at third, Estrada. Not a very smart base running play right there. You don't want to give up an out. Albert Bell came up with it, made a fine throw, and he was out. But he did get the first base hit of the ball game for the Cuban team. High fastball, and he lines it into right center field. Anytime Erickson gets that sinker up, he's going to get hit. And you see Bell comes up. He throws it on the wrong side. Nice play by Revelay to turn and make the tag. Luis Ulisea comes in. Ulasia comes in, and he's actually I see why he thought he was safe. The throw did beat him, but he said he avoided a tag. Runner at third. One out. The Orioles bring the infield in as Duenas, one hopper to short, breaking for the play to Strata, and Bordick has thrown him out. Charles Johnson blocking him off the plate. A very aggressive style of base running here by the, the Cuban runners in this first inning, but the Orioles have been unflappable thus far. Well, they've run themselves into two outs, is what they've done. You have speed, you have to use it, but this is a bad choice here. As you see, the infield is already in, and it's a very easy play. As Gordy throws, you see he's out by about five feet, so no contest at home plate. Throw there in plenty of time, and Charles Johnson completely blocks the play from him, and there's no way for him to get there. But they've run themselves. I mean, if he just. It, it, if they would have stayed at first base with runners at first and third, no one out, they would have been able to score on that ground ball. This is Omar Linares. By the way, uh, Duenas, the, the previous hitter who's now at first base, led the Cuban League in hitting this year by hitting 418. He also stole 17 bases, but here is Omar Linares at the plate. Right to second to Rebel, a shot, but right at him. So Cuba. With a great threat in the first, but after one, we're scoreless in Havana. His grace on the field can't be matched. His cut they do all day, every day. You know, you know the most, uh, I tell you what, uh, all right, let's do it this way. When I grew up, in America, we played baseball all the time. We on fields everywhere. No, yeah, no mas. Here, Aquí. They play baseball all the time. Sí, I love that. Y él le gusta ese I love that. Pero que unos That's cuantos. why you're good. Por eso que... I tell you what, John, that was a great experience for me. I mean, when you're in that crowd and they're talking baseball, you can just feel the love that they have 
for the game. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, these guys, I mean, and, and it's the thing that surprised me the most is how much they know about, you know, Major League Baseball, and it's so difficult for them to find newspapers or get, you know, information, but they all have it. I don't know how they get it, but they have it. B.J. Surhoff in the right center field. That's the first hit for the Orioles against Ivar. So Surhoff, who's just a fine professional hitter, a line drive hitter, always around 300. Signed a new contract uh, with the Orioles during the offseason. So he gets the Orioles first hit. Cuba really they have to be filled with with confidence in their first look at Scott Erickson. I mean had they not run themselves out of the inning they might have really put something together in that first inning. Against them, but they hit the ball with authority. Well you know what I'd like to do is be here tomorrow and go down to Esquina Caliente. That's the hot corner and listen to these guys talk about today's game. I guarantee you there will be some debates going on there tomorrow about that first inning that the Cubans ran themselves out of. Now Harold Baines left handed hitter and uh, where was that a little high I guess one ball to no strikes to Harold Baines 300 last year nine homers 57 RBIs still with the Orioles a native Marylander He's another guy always hits around 300 middle infield double play depth for Cuba. And the bottom misses very high ball two. Well the one thing I'm noticing about both pitchers uh, Eric's in the same way they're getting their pitches up and neither one of them are overpowering when they get the ball up in the strike zone. He was able to get a strikeout in the first inning on board it with two strikes by going upstairs but you can't do that when you're behind in the count. Easily back to the bag at first is Sirhoff kind of a, a a wide throw there by Ivar causing the first baseman Chapey to come off the bag. And then Sirhoff was already back in the bag anyway. No scores, second inning. Foul ground, third base side, Linares. No chance, it's in amongst the spectators. John, two balls and a strike. John, they say that Omar Linares is the best player in the world. That's the way he is built here in Cuba. They say he's the best baseball player in the world. And he does have some imposing statistics. I mean, he has been the home run leader. He's been everything here, complete player. A lot of people compare him to Mike Schmidt, meaning that he can do everything. He can run, he can hit, he can hit with power, and he plays defense very well. 377 lifetime average in the uh, the Cuban League. Baines, another Papa. Linares again comes over, but he's two is back out of play. So the count, two balls, two strikes to Baines. One thing, too, when, when people talk about Cuban baseball, there's a tendency here and it seems to be built into the system under Fidel to talk about Cuban baseball as being only since the revolution. But many old timers will tell you that Martin Digo was the, the great all round player who played long long before Linares ever got got here and Digo not only who was known as El Inmortal not only was a great hitter but he was a great pitcher as well a power pitcher who could do it all truly. Second. That's Duenas. And to second base goes Surhoff on the out. There is one away. Let's go now to our colleague Alvaro Martin. Gentlemen, we have uh, an interesting situation here. They're using these uh, Vatos balls manufactured in Cuba since 1965. They call in Cuban uh, parlance fofitas, which means wimpy. They say, well, we need to use these bats now, these wooden bats, but at least we're using, we're using now our balls. One more thing. They do watch these broadcasts on Sunday night, so they know about John Miller and Joe Morgan. All right. See, I, I told you, Joe, they know about you everywhere. <laughs> well, when I went down to the park yesterday, I mean, they were excited. I, I, I was very impressed with, like I said, their knowledge of, of, of Major League Baseball. I guess they get it from our Sunday night telecast. Here now is uh, Willis Otanias playing in place of Cal Ripken, who is home with his family. And there's ball one. Otanias, a top Orioles prospect, had a great year last year in the minor leagues. He is without options, so the Orioles would like to find a spot for him so as not to have to uh, risk losing him in, on waivers. Well, when I watched him in batting practice today, John, I was very impressed. The ball jumps off his bat. He has a nice swing, so I, I, I don't think they're going to let him get away. They have to find a way of keeping him. Swings the bat very well. Playing third base, first base. Off the fists. Covering Ibar. Takes the throw from Chapey as Surhoff goes to third base. 
and we talked about this earlier, but that's one of the problems. You when you haven't seen a pitcher and you walk up and get in the batter's box, you see one or two pitches, you just cannot tell how much that ball's moved. See the movement, the ball starts over the middle of the plate and really ran in on Otanias, and, he, and that was the reason he couldn't handle that pitch. It looked like it was going to be a fat pitch out over the plate, but he did not know how much movement it was going to have on it, and the ball really moved in on him. So Ebar does have a lot of movement on his fastball. Not Charles Johnson, the former Florida Marlin, who last year had his world uh, turned upside down and shocked to be traded to the Los Angeles Dodgers in the deal that sent Mike Piazza briefly to Florida. And there's ball one. The Orioles, meanwhile, have been looking for a, a catcher for a long, long time. Chris Hoyles had been the catcher for several years, but always more for his bat than for his uh, catching and throwing abilities. But this guy, as a catcher, is the complete package. He's a weapon behind the plate, as Joe was mentioning earlier. Great defensive player. I think the best description I've ever heard of Charles Johnson is when he's behind the plate, there's a green light and a red light. And when he's back there, there's always a red light, which means do not try to run. And so oftentimes he can shut down a running game just because he's there. 2 0 the count. Sir Hoff at third. There's no score in the game. We're in the second inning. There's manager Urquiola of Cuba in his first year this year, actually just finishing his first year as a manager at the, the highest level of the Cuban leagues. He had eight, uh, or rather nine years in the, uh, the second level, almost the equivalent, I guess, of a triple A ball back home and he had a history of championships there. Uh, Rukiola's teams in nine years at the second level won eight championships. And he got his uh, first year at the big time this year with uh, Pinar del Rio. Three and oh. Jeff Rebele is on deck. And Jeff Rebele of course is not as powerful as Charles Johnson. If this lineup to open the season for the Orioles in this kind of a scenario you might see a lot of pitchers pitch around Charles Johnson. Well but I think he will have the hit hit sign here. I think he'll be able to take a hack if he likes it. Johnson well capable of launching one. Deep left center. And there she goes. He has launched one. Now the Os Pelota. Two nothing Orioles. Well, so Joe, you called it, but apparently Ivar thought he was taken. Well, no, it's unusual, and that's one of the differences you will find, say, in Major League Baseball and other forms of baseball, whether it be amateur or professional in another country. Look where they're set up, fastball inside. You never want to throw a hitter a fastball middle of the plate in 3-0 and because if he's swinging, that's what he wants. He's looking for a pitch middle of the plate in. He got it middle of the plate in down a little bit and he put a charge into it. You always throw middle away on three and oh if you think a guy's going to swing. Now Jeff Rebele that is a strike. Well we've seen Ivar do a couple of things that you would admonish him never to do in the big leagues. One was to walk somebody in front of Albert Bell with two out and nobody out. And the other is to throw a, to groove one on three and oh to Charles Johnson. Johnson a good low ball hitter too. And if we didn't already realize that, we know it now for sure. And the Cuban bullpen is going to get busy again. 2 0, Baltimore ahead, the Major League power striking here in the second. And it's a ball to Revelo. Two balls and a strike. And the one thing we talked about it at the beginning is that the Cuban national team will not be able to win a slugfest with the Orioles. Their pitchers will have to hold them down. They're not going to be able to give up three or more runs from this point on and still expect to win this ball game. Popped up. Foul ground first base side. Chapayi. Oh look out. The wind started to carry it and he tumbled right into a group of Orioles there including Scott Kamenecki and he made the catch. Two nothing Baltimore. Is Jason there? I'll see. We move to the last of the second. Here's that play by Chapayi. And you see that several Orioles were on the field of play there. And he ended up right on top of Scott Kamenecki there to the right. And uh, Kamenecki, who's, who's already nursing an injury as it is. 
Ray Miller went out, summoned by the first base umpire Cesar Valdez after the inning. And Valdez apparently ordered, ordered those Orioles plays off the field of play, Joe, which during spring training it would be common to see guys sitting out there like that, but a regular season game. So we're playing it that way here. Strike one to Andy Morales. And that's Brady Anderson. That is one away in the Cuban second. Let's take a look at Juan Manrique as he gives the sign to Ebar on the 3-0 pitch to Charles Johnson. He wants that pitch down and in, which I still don't think is a way to throw it, but the ball, you can see, moved back over the plate a little bit. And afterwards, you can see Manrique talking to Ebar. He said, I wanted it down and in. You threw it over the middle of the plate. And that's why you got hit. But probably they're both wrong. Yeah, well, I don't think you should ever throw a, a strong hitter like Johnson in when it's a 3-0 count. Loidel Chapeyi, the first baseman who made that nice catch on the pop up by Rebolet. And he takes a called strike from Erickson. Chapeyi at 3.14 with five homers during the regular season. One ball and one strike. The uh, Cuban bullpen stays busy. There is uh, Contreras. He's been up a couple of times now. Erickson. Erickson kind of all over the place right now. He's, he's not have much sharpness. I'm a little surprised. I thought he would, you know, after the first inning, he would settle down. Look, there are a lot of emotions involved in this ball game, so the first inning might have been a little hyper. But I expected him to settle down, and he hasn't been able to do that. And in the second inning, you figure he's throwing enough pitches now that he's used to the mound, you know, and he's able to gather his rhythm. Three and one, the count. And sinker over the outside. Tough pitch. Three and two the count. Right. Checking themselves from the, the rays of the sun here in the Caribbean. It's a warm day in the 80s, but a very pleasant breeze blowing in off the Caribbean. The, uh, the winds blowing in from right and across toward left here at Estadio Latino Americano. Are those Brock umbrellas? Three and two the count. It's a foul off to the left. Lou Brock will tell you they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we go. Those are pretty large. His weren't that big. No. And now that, now that's an umbrella. Those people came prepared. Three and two. And that's ball four to Chapeyi. That's two walks already by Erickson. So he, he's uh, already working on that pitch count. And they, you know, Ray Miller was not averse to having Erickson pitch up to 100 pitches here today. He's thrown 23 pitches already, however, and we're only in the second inning. One out, one on, and here is. Robert, Robert Keys Vido, the right fielder, 334 average during the regular season. And that's a ball outside. Now the, the regular season ended not quite three weeks ago, and they went into the playoffs after that. And uh, they selected the team. They made a couple of changes since the, the first selections after some of the other teams were eliminated from the playoffs. That's a strike on the outside. But the team was taken off with the, the the wooden bats and they were sort of sequestered. It was a secret even as to where they were. One and one the count. Fans didn't like that last call by the way. That last called strike by the umpire Nelson Diaz brought a, a hail of whistles from the crowd which is uh, another way of of booing expressing uh, discontent with the call. One and two the count. And he tries the slider. Like this is how he hung that one up there. Two and two. Yeah, he doesn't seem to have any rhythm. He's just, you know, throwing the ball. But, you know, it's still spring training as far as he's concerned. But I expected him again to, you know, have a little better rhythm this inning. This ballpark is a, would look to be a friendly home run ballpark. The distances are not too deep. 325 down the lines. 
380 to the deep power alleys, 400 to center. That's out of play. Two balls, two strikes. But again, with the wind blowing in, the ball did not seem to be carrying well. And as the Cubans had told us before the game, the Batos baseballs don't have as much bounce, is the way they put it, as the, the American baseball they don't believe. Not quite as lively, in other words. There's the, the center field dimension. Two and two the count, two below. And Erickson continues to to battle his control. Three and two the count. The one thing I've been surprised when I looked at the statistics was that with the aluminum bat, they still did not have a lot of power. And then it was explained to me the reason for that is because they used the very soft ball to make up for the aluminum bat. The fact that it did propel the ball better than a wooden bat. But now that they're using the wooden bat, they're using a little more, as you say, bounce, has a little more bounce to the ball than the ones they've been playing with with the aluminum bats. One out, one on. There goes the runner. Reveille will have to go to first. And that's out number two. Chapayi, who was running with a pitch, makes it to second. Now Juan Manrique. There's Bud Selig, the commissioner of baseball on the right. Peter Angelos with the open neck blue shirt and the sport coat. And the two on either side of Fidel. Comandante y jefe de Cuba. The commander and chief. And... Uh, in his very fine new book, The Pride of Havana, A History of Cuban Baseball, Roberto Gonzalez Echevarria. That's a swing and a miss on the slider. He tried to check, couldn't do it, did uh, Manrique. But uh, Mr. Uh, Echevarria points out that there's no evidence that Fidel Castro was ever any kind of a baseball player of note, much less a, a former big league prospect. But he so, definitely played and he pitched. But, uh, you know, this, this, you know what I've found, John, since being here? There are a lot of myths about Cuban baseball, about how good some of the players were, and, of course, about Fidel saying that, you know, the Washington Senators wanted to sign him at one time. I mean, I don't even know if he said it, but it's, it's been said, and, uh, and uh, th there's just no evidence that, uh, that he was ever any kind of a player of note. After the revolution, he and uh, some of the other bearded members of the revolution formed a, a, a team that played many games called Los Barbudos, the bearded ones. Oh, strike it. three called the slider. Got him looking. Maybe the best pitch of the day for Erickson. Two nothing Baltimore. Brady Anderson comes up when we return. If you're ready for the biggest and brightest of the silver screen, then you're ready to... Apartment building back behind the left field the grandstand here. People can see the game. We were mentioning Fidel Castro. Here's some old film of El Comandante y Jefe, Fidel, as a uh, as a pitcher for Los Barbudos. What do you think of that uh, swing there, Joe? <laughs> do I have to? <laughs> you know, actually, John, from all my research after since I've been here, I found that actually they say he was a much better basketball player than he was anything else. That he was a pretty good basketball player. And the the yearbook from from his school days was pictured as being a, a top basketball player with no mention of being a baseball player. Brady Anderson the hitter and the count is 0 1. One thing too here in Cuba in the uh, totalitarian regime the, the right of dissent or free speech which we almost take for granted which we hold so dear is certainly not present and uh, if you got somebody who was not in a big crowd of people uh, it was very obvious that there was a great deal of anger really and, and certainly dissent about this decision to close this game except to those who were invited by Fidel and one thing that always seemed to be implicit with baseball here since the revolution was that baseball was to be enjoyed by all, but not this game. One and two to Anderson, and Ibar misses high. Two balls, two strikes. Last night in game two in a critical game of the, the championship final playoff between Industriales and Santiago de Cuba, when you would have expected a full house here at the Latino Americano Stadium. 
the the park was uh, maybe at least a third empty if not more Anderson hit by the pitch and he'll take first Anderson who is very adept at getting hit by pitches often leaves the league in that category here comes the manager Urquiola he's got Contreras up in his bullpen again Brady Anderson just takes that on the elbow I mean he got I'm, armor there too. Yeah, he, he, that's one of the complaints a lot of pitchers have about major league hitters now that they're wearing all kind of armor on their front elbow and getting hit by pitches doesn't bother them anymore. Contreras coming in. We'll be back. Little Caesar is turning for Americano Stadium. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan. The Orioles lead 2 nothing and a home run in the second by Charles Johnson and now here's a new pitcher into the ball game uh, Jose Contreras big guy who throws real hard we understand and we're told by, by, by many Cubans uh, considered a superior pitcher to El Duque now with the New York Yankees and a postseason hero last year for the Yanks. Well, that's another one of those myths I found here in Cuba I mean you cannot say that he's better than El Duque because El Duque is pitching against the best players in the world and also I another myth is that they have two shortstops here who are much better defensively than Ray Ordonez. We saw one of them last night considered by many the best in Cuba today Herman Mesa and Eduardo Pere is the other guy and I, I don't I just don't see how they can be better than Ordonez but a lot of one of the other problems is when Ordonez left here he was still young yeah. so Ordonez did not show his best stuff here. And he is showing it now in the major leagues by winning gold gloves. Mike Bordick the hitter. And it's 0 2 as he faces Contreras. You see that uh, measurement there, 94 miles an hour with that heater. Will Clark on deck. Brady Anderson at first. Nobody out in the third inning. The Orioles ahead, 2 0. Well, Ordonez, it's thought that one of the reasons that he left was because he really didn't have much of a shot even to play here for the national team. He was, he was third on the depth chart. Behind those two. To third, Linares. Gets one there. Back to first. Two. Wow. Quite a turn at second by Duenas. One out, one on. Now let's go to our colleague Alvaro Martin. Thanks, John. We're joined by Buck Seeley, Commissioner of Baseball. But why are we here? Well we're here because we believe and our government believes that this is a very important part of a cultural and sports exchange between these two countries and after a lot of thought and a lot of very sensitive concerns being raised that we were very sensitive about we believe that this is a, a linchpin and a very important part of that sports and cultural exchange between the United States and Cuba. Not even two weeks ago four dissidents here were sent to jail for about four years each. There are a lot of Cuban Americans and others in the states that do not agree with us being here. What do you have to say to them? Well, as I said, uh, you know, all the concerns raised were valid. We were very sensitive about them. But on balance, because our government wanted to do it and because we believe in the long run, it will, it will do a lot of good. And uh, baseball is the national pastime for both the United States and Cuba. We think it is that important part of a sports and cultural exchange, which is now ongoing. How's the conversation been so far? talked a lot of baseball we've talked a lot of baseball and uh, it's been a very very interesting weekend. Thank you very much. Thank Back to the booth. Thank you Alvaro. Will Clark is uh, on a first pitch driven one deep to right caught out there by Vito. Uh, Peter Angelos the owner of the Orioles who was uh, instrumental in making uh, this trip happen as he uh, has pursued it actually for the last three years as Albert Bell comes up now two down Mike Bordick the runner at first. The Orioles ahead 2 0. Albert Bell, who has always worn number eight in the past, and of course in Baltimore, number eight is now and will forever be worn by Cal Ripken. So Albert is now wearing number 88 with his new ball club. He bounced to third his first time. Albert hit one in batting practice with the wind blowing in at the time that landed beneath a light standard out there and straightaway left. It was just uh, an awesome shot up into the highest level of the bleachers out there. Check swing and a foul off to the right. One ball, one strike. 
Contreras also throws a fork ball. That's kind of his out pitch, but he has a good fastball to go along with it. You see those light standards. The, the one in straightaway left, he hit it right beneath the, uh, the light standard. One ball, one strike to Albert. There goes Bordick. The throw down. He's in there. Enrique saw a little bit late. And Bordick steals second. Two and one to Albert Bell. Well, watching Contreras, he does not have a good move to first base. He hasn't shown us one, but he's very slow to the plate. So Bordick takes advantage of that. Pretty quick release there by Manrique. Pretty quick tag there, too, by Duenas in second, but he was clearly in. Jose Contreras, he was nine and three during the, uh, the Cuban League season. He missed a full month after breaking a knuckle, punching a fence. Ooh. Living dangerously there with Albert. But he got it past him. Two and two. It seemed to me that happened to Doyle Alexander one year. It looked like it might have been a fork ball that didn't move very much, and that's maybe why it fooled Albert. He saw the spin on it, but it didn't do very much. See Albert upset that he chase that pitch out of the strike zone. Power versus power here. The hearts run Contreras against the slugger Albert Bell. Two down in the third inning. He just fought that one off. I think Albert Bell is really underrated as far as his hitting is concerned. You'll see him do that a lot. Just kind of spoil pitches until the pitcher will make a mistake sometime then he'll hammer it. But he was he just fouled that pitch off. He knew he couldn't do much with it. Just seemed to be able to flick it foul. That rare combination of, of slugger and just real good all round hitter. The 328 last year. Contreras working very deliberately here with Bell. Albert backs away for a moment. Say Contreras, 28 years old. Bordick at second. Slider and he struck him out. Got him to chase it. One man left. The Orioles two, Cuba nothing after two and a half. Baseball never had a season like the last one. 125 wins. The uh, assembling place for the uh, communist revolution, the site of the annual May Day parade, and where the uh, the large statue of Jose Marti, a national hero of independence from the, uh, the late. 19th century actually when Cuba won its independence from Spain. And also the site where uh, Fidel will address the people. One ball, one strike to Moreno. This foul pop is caught by Will Clark. And there is one away. The 1999 Major League Baseball season will officially get underway next Sunday night in our 10th season of Sunday Night Baseball. Vinny Castilla returns home as his Colorado Rockies travel to Mexico Monterrey to face Tony Gwynn and the defending National League champion San Diego Padres that's eight Eastern five Pacific six Mountain Time next Sunday night and we'll hope you'll join us all through the 1999 season our 10th year of Sunday night baseball although to Joe and I it seems like more <laughs> we're sick of each other by now next Sunday and for the first time an opening day game will be played somewhere other than the United States or Canada. The Padres and Rockies from Monterrey, Mexico. Jose Estrada, the leadoff man for Cuba, off the fists. Really got jammed there. Will Clark, two down. And that's what we expected a lot of from Erickson with these Cuban hitters simply because they have adjusted from the, the aluminum bat to the wood bat. And you have to remember what happens as your bat speed slows down. You have a lot of bat speed with the aluminum bat and a lot of hitting surface. With a wood bat, you only have a very small surface and you lose a lot of bat speed when you go to the heavier bat. And you can see all the bats in the bat rack are wood. There's the man who's supposed to be the great butter. He bunts but foul. That's Ulasia. And that's one of the things that they do here with two outs. They will still bunt and as we all know in American baseball you normally do not bunt with two outs you try to get an extra base hit put yourself in scoring position but they play a different style of ball here because they do not have a lot of power. Up 
the middle, base hit. And Dulacier has the only two hits of the game for Cuba. This time he wisely is content with just his one base. He got thrown out by Albert Bell in an ill-advised attempt to stretch it into a double in the first inning. John Peter Pascarelli and I were trying to come up with you know, Cuban sluggers who have played you know in the major leagues. And of course my first thought would be Tony Perez who was a slugger on this great Cincinnati Reds team. Of course Rafael Palmero. But other than that, normally you're, it's not a lot of sluggers have come from Cuba. Sluggers, I should say, guys hit 40 home runs or more. And a lot of great hitters. Jose Canseco. Yeah. Well, I born here. Okay. I mean, I missed he missed him. He was. He was. We missed him. He's a pretty good slugger. Yeah. He fits. Duenas, the league batting champion, on the first pitch grounds out to Revelo, and that is the inning. One man left. B.J. Surhoff coming up, then Harold Baines. The Orioles lead Cuba two to nothing. Part of Havana. Opened back in 1902, they make 50 different varieties of cigars. The factory reader entertains the workers by reading novels, newspapers, and announcements aloud to them. Makes uh, 20 million cigars a year there. Exported all over the world <laughs> except the United States, but enjoyed by many in our crew while we're here. John, I don't even smoke, but I... Enjoyed one myself last night. I've never seen you smoke, and <laughs> since we've been here, you're doing nothing but smoking. Change your nickname from Little Joe to El Cigarrillo. Cigarro. Top of the fourth inning, the Orioles coming up now, leading 2 0. B.J. Surhoff, who started a two run second inning rally with a single, will now face Jose Contreras, the right hander. Harold Baines and Willis Ortanez will follow. In the fourth inning, John, you, when you go to a country, you have to try all of its delicacies, and you know you have to try everything. Well, we had the uh, moros y cristianos, see the beans and rice last night. Although some people prefer the uh, frijoles negros y uh, the arroz blanco. I had tried all those things. Tony Perez and his wife Patuca introduced me to those things when we played together in Cincinnati. But I've also tried something else. They have a mojito here. That's kind of the national drink. Now you you tried enough of those for Tony <laughs> Pachuca and yourself. Yeah. Our, our Alvaro Martin is standing by with a guest. Alvaro. Yes, it's Oriole principal owner Peter Angelo who's the driving force behind this game. And the first question is, you have no personal connection to Cuba, but you've been working very hard for three years to get pull this game off. Why? That's true. Well, I think you can see the reason why. If you look about you, you'll see 55,000 to 60,000 uh, Cubans, uh, the whole city of Havana, and the country itself is electrified by the presence of a major league ball club. And there's an affinity between the Cuban people and the American people that historically has been there. What we're trying to do, or what I had in mind, was to try to start bringing the peoples together. And with respect to the political differences, which are substantial, I think as time goes by, as we have more of these contacts, that those problems will begin to evaporate and ultimately America our country the United States and the Cubans and their and their government presumably will be uh, uh, together uh, as uh, let's say partners and uh, neighbors in the Western Hemisphere any special precautions for the May 3rd game at Camden Yards well we always take very good and strong precautions no matter what the game may be we maintain a certain level of performance that is uh, within the ballpark uh, is we think our ballpark is probably the best run and the most inviting and appealing in Major League Baseball so we'll do all that uh, will we have any special uh, uh, we don't see any need for it but if we believe that there is a need or if it appears there may be a need we will take those precautions now this is for this is for this season we have a game here home and away what about what have you heard about the future future plans other teams doing this well my understanding is that at least two and maybe three other major league uh, ball clubs have applied for a license to visit Cuba in the same fashion that we have and uh, which un underlines the fact that this is not an uh, Oriole preserve or exclusively an Oriole venture I think other major league teams will come. I think you'll have even more contact among uh, the Cuban people uh, and the Amer uh, U.S. people. And I think eventually, as I said, I think the re relations between the two countries will definitely improve. We thank you very much for taking the time, and good luck to you. You're welcome. Back to Joe and John. Alvaro, thank you. Peter Angelos, the principal owner of the Baltimore Orioles.
And uh, we, we also, uh, once again, should point out, uh, in light of uh, what he said there at the beginning, uh, Mr. Angelos, that although the, the huge crowd is here, and, and no doubt they are very passionate about the game of baseball, this huge crowd was actually handpicked by invitation here at the uh, ballpark today. And, and truly, last night when we had the great pleasure of being here, Joe, for the, the big playoff game, Industriales and uh, Santiago de Cuba, I mean, the, the, the beat never stopped. The, 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 the salsa rhythm from the uh, Rudy sections just seemed to go on and on through the night as uh, the game was played almost to that rhythm. Harold Baines grounds out as Sirhoff, who walked, moves over to second, and there is one away. This is a much uh, calmer, quieter crowd than what we saw here last night and with the league uh, championships going on. And you mentioned last night. Take a listen. The big play of the ninth inning, by the way, that turned the game around, that was a fair ball and a huge argument started. And one of the uh, players from Santiago threw his glove at the umpire. That was the first baseman. He got tossed out of the game with that big uh, rhubarb. And a little while later, the winning run scored amazingly when the reserve first baseman, not an experienced first baseman, was not at the bag as they tried to turn a game ending double play. And instead, the game ended as two runs scored as the second baseman's throw to first went to an empty bag. Three run ninth inning for Industriales, and uh, they were down seven to five. They won the game eight to seven, and they lead the Santiago de Cuba two games to none. The, that series, a best of seven, will move to Santiago. And the, I guess you'd call it the, the Cuban equivalent of the Midwest later this week. Linares, after looking Sirhawk back, throws out Willis Otanez, and that is out number two. Now, also, Last night, as we had started to mention earlier, there was not the real large crowd you would have expected. As we take a look uh, again at Linares making this throw after looking Sirhawk back. But Joe, the, there was a, I don't know if it was speculation or informed speculation or just a rumor, but there was talk at the ballpark and around town last night that many fans who would have been here to fill this place for a big playoff game were making their own silent protest or boycott of the game against the the fact that today's game was by invitation only tickets were distributed through centros de trabajo at workplace centers there's some people who uh, across the street a la Wrigley Field are viewing the action from apartments the batter Charles Johnson he has driven in the only run to this game with a two run homer back in the second inning. Two nothing Baltimore. We're in the fourth. Joe and I last night when that wild ninth inning was unfolding we're actually at a, at a restaurant and enjoyed the ninth inning with many of the, the, the passionate fans who were, who were there bartenders waiters and the place went nuts as Industrialis the favorite team here in Havana made their great comeback it was Herman Aguila who was the home plate umpire last night he's umpiring at second base here today and he was the umpire that made that call and, and the replay showed a very good call on that bunt but he's also the one who got a hit in the face with the thrown glove by the first baseman from, from Santiago that was a lot better three and old pitch from Contreras and we saw from Ebar that was three and zero, oh, and that was toward the outside part of the plate, and Johnson took it. Johnson's home run came on a three and zero oh pitch, right out over the plate. Back in the second, three and one now. And that's the walk. So two walks in the inning by Contreras puts two men on with two men out, and Jeff Rebele will come up. De Delano DeShields is here with the Orioles, their new second baseman. But he suffered a broken thumb on sort of a freakish play and early in the spring, a line drive. He caught it and it broke his thumb. That must have been really hard hit. And he will probably have to miss the first uh, part of the season, at least maybe the first week or so, if not more. He'd like Jeff Revelay to play second in his absence, but he's got a heel problem. He's got a bone spur in his heel. 
And they don't know if he'll be able to go or not. He's only been able to play for a day or two at a time and then have to take a day or two off because of the pain. He did not play yesterday. And is in there today. Albert Bell in the dugout. His teammates looking on. But they have a rookie by the name of Jesse Garcia that Ray Miller has been very pleased with. And if Rebele is not ready to open the season. Place of the Shields, uh, Jesse Garcia might even get a look. Two nothing for the Orioles. Contreras is really taking his time out there. Big moment here because Cuba already down two nothing. They don't want to get any further behind. Surhoff at second, Johnson at first. For the outside, one ball, one strike. First base side, Chappie E picks it up. One ball, two strikes to Jeff Rebele. There's a young fella. Probably thinking one of these days I'll be out there playing. And he probably will because that's what most Cuban young men want to do. They want to grow up and be Major League Baseball players if they can go to the States. If not, be players here in Cuba. I mean, when we, whenever we saw, as we were making our way around town, we saw an empty lot. There was a ball game going. Yeah, it was very interesting. And a lot of them, they were didn't even have gloves. They just had a makeshift baseball and a wooden stick. One ball, two strikes. Two on, two out. Two and two. High hard one missing inside. And you know, Delano De Shields, who visited some some young players yesterday is here with the Orioles and I like what he said about it Joe he said hey this is why I'm here for these kids uh, they love the game and there's no politics with them it's all about baseball with the kids and that's a foul off to the right Delino who is uh, very outgoing with kids I mean he relates well to them. And uh, I mean, he won the, the, the Cuban children over very quickly, putting on a little clinic yesterday. Two balls, two strikes, two out, two on. The Orioles ahead, two nothing in the fourth inning. Struck him out. Omar Linares, the Cuban legend, coming up. To Cuba after a 40 year absence, the Baltimore Orioles representing the major leagues, taking on a group of Cuban All Stars, not all of the All Stars, but a group of them. The Orioles lead 2 0 as Omar Linares comes up. And a slow curveball from Erickson for a strike. Linares, a lifetime 371 batting average, 377 league home runs. Strike two on the outside corner. Not that outside pitch there. Linares lined out hard to Rebele at second his first time. 2 0 Baltimore ahead. Slider misses. 1 and 2. He only had 87 at bats in the league season this year with a hamstring problem. And there was speculation of whether he was going to play in the field today or not. He was originally scheduled to be the DH. But he said he felt well enough to be able to take his customary position over at third base. Two and two. Changed up, missing high. Three and two now to Linares. Andy Morales on deck. Louis Del Chapey do up third. Rebele, but he throws him out anyway. Linares is retired. Well, yesterday when Delano De Shields arrived here in Cuba, he was asked his thoughts about playing this game in Cuba. You know, I think it all starts with the kids. 
you know, if they can keep up these kind of exchanges with the youth, I think that's where it starts at to me because, uh, I mean, we're, we're kind of setting our ways. We're old folks, so to speak, and, you know, politics has got us by the neck, so to speak, but the kids, I think that's where it starts. Now, Morales, Rebele can't handle it. Well, Rebele had a lot more time than they, he felt he had because it was a high hop and you just do not miss a ball like this unless you take your eyes off of it. Well, he kind of leaped for it as well. That was more like a spring training play. Well, they have uh, scored it as a base hit for Morales. No, I'm going to score it an error. <laughs> the major league player should make that play. Well, don't tell it to me. Tell it to Fidel. No, I. <laughs> and that's ball one to Chapayi. Two nothing. The Orioles ahead. One out. One on for Cuba. The official scorer is. Uh, from Cuba, as are all of the umpires. The shortstop, Bordic, is one. Rebelay to first. Not in time. Champayi runs pretty well. Easily beat the return. Two down. Morales forced out at second. It's interesting to see how the difference in the Cuban second baseman making the double play and, and watching the Orioles second baseman make the double play. The Cuban second baseman depends on quickness and get rid of the ball quick, quick hands. Rebele was going to depend on his arm to make that double play. So a big difference between the two. Here is Robert Kies Vido. On one. Two nothing. The Orioles ahead. Last of the fourth. Two strikes the count. Well, some of the uh, top Cuban players who are still involved in the, the postseason not on this team. So some of them last night, including Herman Mesa, the shortstop. I mean, they turned a couple of spectacular double plays last night in that game. One ball, two strikes. Rebele just in time for the fourth out on Champagne. Ceremonies. The flags of the two countries were paraded on the field. B.J. Surhoff brought the stars and stripes out. And then former major leaguer Connie Marrero threw out the first ball to Brady Anderson who buttered it. Fidel is here plus 55,000 people invited to attend. Brady Anderson leads off now against the guy who throws a little bit harder right now than does uh, Conrado Marrero. He entertained the fans though by insisting that Brady come up there rather than just uh, throwing out the ceremonial first pitch. He threw out, he warmed up a little bit and then invited Brady to stand in the batter's box. Brady Anderson is lined out to right, has been hit by a pitch. And that's ball one. The Orioles played a game yesterday in Port St. Lucie against the Mets and then flew down here arriving uh, early last evening. And uh, press conferences, there were receptions. That is just foul on the right field line into the Orioles bullpen area. And the Orioles before they head back, they've got another exhibition game tomorrow in South Florida. There's Eddie Murray with Albert Bell, Mike Flanagan. Richie Bansell, the trainer, B.J. Surhoff, Chris Hoyles. There's another reception tonight here in uh, Havana. That's the Orioles with a 10 before they fly back. A little bit high, three and one. And uh, earlier on, you saw numerous Orioles who brought their little. Uh, VCRs, mini. What do we call those? Mini cams. I'm not up on my video, Joe. I know you are. Yeah, video cameras. Video cameras. All right. We also understand 
about 500 members of the media here covering this game from all around the world about 300 down from the, the United States and Canada strike three call good fastball that moved back over the inside part of the plate started off the plate inside and he just kind of froze Brady Brady knew it was strike three good pitch there from Contreras watch this pitch starts inside 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 now you see the movement right back over the inside corner that looks like a Greg Maddox fastball right there he does that a lot starts the ball off the plate inside moves it back on the inside corner to left handed hitters that was nasty here's Mike Bordick bluffing the bunt taking a ball Bordick has struck out and hit into a force play he is 0 for 2. Again, uh, an entirely different atmosphere for this game than the one we encountered here last night with the league game going on. John, I'm a little disappointed, not for myself so much, but for the fans back home who do not get a chance to, you know, just to view the atmosphere we saw here last night. I mean, Santiago, the team that they were playing, they have their own band that travels with them. Base hit to left for Bordick. And uh, they play Cuban music throughout the entire ball game. I mean, they start from the opening first pitch right on through to the end. I mean, it was just really kind of a big party. It was, and it was really, it was a lot of fun to be here. Yes, yeah, a big, uh, and I'm just a little disappointed that they do not, the American fans do not get a chance to see that. They have their cheerleaders dance on the dugouts. I mean, it's just a, a total party. A little more subdued fans here, here today. And part of that, I think, is uh, that Baltimore took an early lead in this game. Plus, the Cuban team had a couple of uh, regrettable decisions on the base pass in the first inning, an inning that they might have broken through first. I mean, this game turned around in a hurry. I mean, Cuba made two different outs on the bases in the first inning. And then in the next half inning, Baltimore scored two runs on really an ill-advised pitch a 3 and 0 pitch that ended up right over the heart of the plate to Charles Johnson from uh, Jose Ibar easily back was Bordick one strike to count to Will Clark uh, be that as it may the Orioles leading this ball game and Scott Erickson they kind of uh, let him off the hook he's kind of settled in a little bit now it's a ball outside and the Orioles are are up by only two runs in that first inning a single by Ulasia and he tried to stretch it Albert Bell threw him out at second and then with the runner at third the next batter Duenas bounced to short and Estrada tried to go home even though the infield was in he was easily thrown out by Bordick and they got nothing out of that first inning despite a walk and a base hit. They could have had first and third with nobody out in their third and fourth place hitters coming up. Were it not for Ulasia being thrown out at second. Ball two, two balls and a strike. Cuba, population. I mean, this is a very large place. I had never actually realized, Joe. I mean, it's uh, eight or nine hundred miles long, if not longer. And a uh, population of around 12 million people. But 12 million to draw from for baseball talent versus the United States of what, 250 to 300 million. So while there is great baseball talent here, I mean, there's not quite the, the pool of talent that you would find in a country as large as the United States. Now, one of the things I learned of being here, you know, for the last couple of days, if you ask people, you know, why, you know, they're so into baseball you know they all kind of have stock answers it's like you know we have an emotional link to baseball we're born you know to be baseball fans but I, one thing that you also find out is they love Ken Griffey Jr. here I mean he was their favorite player amongst all of you know the, the players that they could name they love Ken Griffey Jr. of course they may change a little bit now that McGuire and Sosa are becoming so internationally well known but Ken Griffey Jr. was the choice of all the young people here. They, they, he's their hero. And you learned that the Esquina Caliente? Yes. Learned a lot there. I mean, you learn everything there, man, you know, about baseball. There goes Bordick. Will Clark takes strike three call. But, and he's out at second base. Nice Got him with a tag on the foot. 
Moreno the shortstop tags him out and Albert Bell does not get a chance to hit. We go to the last of the fifth. Two nothing Baltimore. Been here prior to the revolution. You might have seen many of these same cars in the streets of Havana. American cars vintage for sure still operating. And there's going to be a lot of ingenious auto mechanics yes. around here Joe. <laughs> Real good ones. Here is Juan Manrique who just threw out Bordic to complete a double play. And he leads off here for Cuba the eighth place hitter. He struck out looking his first time on one the count as he tried to bunt. Moreno and Estrada will follow. Scott Erickson the pitcher for Baltimore. That's a foul out of play. Oh and, oh and two the count. John another thing I found out about the kids and why they're so into baseball they have what they call sports initiations. And they're like sports schools. You know, you go to those schools to be trained in, you know, some sort of sport, whether it be baseball or another sport. And they train you, you know, to be players. And that's and as you get better, you move up to some team and eventually your goal is to be on a national team. And that's how they train them from eight years old to be, you know, in the sports. Well, that's really uh from the, the Soviet era. Right, exactly. Soviet system. And, and also, John, another thing is kind of interesting. Castro made the statement in 61, basically, when he said that now sports will go from being a commercial activity to an education and cultural activity. And that's the reason there aren't any professional, you know, a lot of the professional athletes left here and came to America, the ones that left in 61 to come and play in the major leagues. Tough pitch and he struck him out. Enrique really got jammed on that one. Tried to hold up his swing couldn't do it. One out in the fifth inning. That's only the second strikeout for Erickson in this ball game. Both times have been Manrique. Yeah, and you can see Manrique tried to check his swing there but he definitely went too far. Well he may not see too many sinkers that slide in that yeah. much. <laughs> one hopper to third Otanias. Throws out Juan C. Moreno. Those last two pitches are more like the Erickson that we've seen a lot of the last couple of years in Baltimore. That ball there really sunk down and in. And it was actually a good swing there by Moreno to get him the ball out of his kitchen. Women's NCAA Tournament Championship game on ESPN from San Jose tonight, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. Duke and Purdue. Right center field, Albert Bell. And Estrada, the leadoff man, is gone on one pitch. Albert Bell will be coming up. Erickson of the Orioles leading Cuba 2 0 after five. In Havana? Yeah, but that's like a three piece, you know, ensemble compared to what they had here last night. They had a full orchestra here last night. Well, I wish I was sitting out there with those guys. <laughs> out in the bleachers. Looks like Wrigley Field out there. 2 0, the Orioles ahead as we go to the sixth inning from Estadio Latino Americano in Havana. John, they, they have a lot of problem deciding who actually brought baseball to Cuba. In 1870, they said it was Estan Bayon, but like Abner Doubleday is considered to be the guy in America up until recently, they have now said that no, they played baseball here in Cuba before he brought the game back from Fordham. So controversy here as well. Well I was told since the 1860s they had yeah, the baseball well, here. But they said 1870. Esteban Bayan is the guy I'm going to give credit to because he's the only name they came up with. Well, I, I, have, I have never doubted <laughs> anything you've ever told me about Cuban baseball history that's for sure. But at least they have a name with it in 1870. They didn't have a name in 1860. But you, you know there were Two teams here. They were the, the, the famous teams in Cuba. Uh, Almendares and the uh, Habana Leones or Habana Lo or Rojos were great rivals. A foul ball by Albert Bell, who has hit into a four side and he was also struck out, and he is 0 2. But they began playing one another in 1878. Now that is an old rivalry that right. even predates the Giants and the Dodgers. And predates the Yankees and the Red Sox in the United States. Alvaro, what do you say? Gentlemen, Numesio Guillo was a, a, a Cuban that went to 
Tallahassee, Florida, to study at a junior college and brought back some bag, bats and gloves. And there's a recorded uh, newspaper article in that game they played. But the first game was between Havana and Matanzas in 1874. The 125th anniversary will be celebrated on December 26th. And uh, Havana beat Matanzas 51 to 9. And Bellan hit three home runs. Uh, they were, the ball was juiced that year. <laughs> Albert Bell strikes out for the second time in a row against Contreras. He's gotten him twice. And Albert is 0 for 3. Alvaro, I like your information, but you didn't take a side there. Was it 1870 or 1860? Well, the first. If you deal with John, you have to you have to come up with a you have to make a stand here. Nemesio Guillo came here in the 1860s, 1869 or so. Okay. Uh, Bellan played for the Troy Haymakers of the National Association. Played 59 games in the early 1870s, and then came here in 1874. Okay. So the first game, recorded game with a box score, was in 1874. All of this is in a great book called Baseball with a Latin Beat by Peter Bjarkman. It's an excellent book. Yeah. I read part of that book. Strike one to B.J. Serhoff. A single and a walk in this game. In center field, Estrada. And that is out number two. Serhoff is quickly gone. And Harold Baines will come up. Well, what I was trying to get into was this tradition of these rivals, Alamendares and the Havana Lions since 1878 and the year that this ballpark opened the 1946 47 season was perhaps the the most memorable pennant race ever in Cuban baseball and these were professional players at that time and I mean professionals what we would call professionals although the Cuban players today are, are really professionals I mean they're reimbursed for playing uh, that's another story but this ballpark open there's a, there's a great deal of history here dating back to its first year Baines with the drive deep into left field Ulasia, and it's out of play when might have gotten up into the wind a little bit it really carried the count to Baines one ball one strike but a, a great comeback in the pennant race by Almendaris and the pennant race went to the final game of the season right here and Max Lanier a great pitcher with the St. Louis Cardinals. Hal's father. Yeah. Was it was a star pitcher for Almendaris. And with one day's rest, he pitched against the Havana Lions and defeated them and rather handily. And they won that, that incredible pennant race in the first year of baseball in this stadium. And uh, Sal Magley played in the league at that time. Uh, there were a lot of uh, Americans in the major leagues who came down here to play. And a lot of African Americans play here as well, John. Who could not play could in the not major play leagues. Majors in America, but they were able to play in the major leagues here in Cuba, and they came down and played. Martin Diego, who is considered by many the greatest player of all time from Cuba, also played in the Negro Leagues up in the U.S. Baines is thrown out by Duenas. Three up and three down. Two nothing. Baltimore. Well, let's get going. Okay, there is no time to lose. Subscribers are waiting. We have to send out these official ESPN the magazine duffel bags. Lisa Ulasia, who has two of the three Cuban hits, leads it off. Yoval Duenas and then Omar Linares to follow. That's a strike. One ball and one strike. So Ulasia has got two for two. Duenas, the man on deck, is the batting champion. And then Linares, the legend. Will Clark, he'll take it himself. And Ulasia is retired. Well, while this baseball exchange is happening here, also in town are musicians from the United States and around the world, part of a musical exchange, Music Bridges, it's called. Let's go down now to Alvaro Martin. Thanks, John. I'm here with beloved singer-songwriter Jimmy Buffett, a Cubs fan. He also roots for the Orioles, certainly, this weekend. He's also visiting for the third time what he calls Mojitoville. How's it going? <laughs> I'm all right, Al. There's a little break in the action here, huh? Uh, what are you, you're here writing songs, supposedly, with some Cuban songwriters paired off with also some American uh, musicians as well. Yeah, it's been going on all week. Bonnie Raitt, Mick Fleetwood, uh, name a few old friends and some young writers, and it's a combination of uh, collecting, writing with Cuban songwriters and American songwriters, and there's a show tonight to, to kind of uh, showcase the work. How are, how are the Cubs going to do this year? Oh, we're in mourning already. <laughs> it's always an adventure. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Back to the booth. All right, uh, Jimmy Buffett. I thought he was going to sing the national anthem for this game today. 
There's a ball hit by Duenas, the batting champion. He's thrown out by Revela, and he's 0 for 3. He's not been able to get the ball out of the infield against Erickson. But you did notice Jim Buffett has sampled the delicacies of the island as well. Mojitoville. Call it Mojitoville. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the great drink here, Mojitos. Jimmy Buffett. Well, that concert's tonight, right? Yeah. Gladys Knight is also here, one of my favorite artists. She's in town. Linares to right field, Albert Bell, and it's a very quick inning. The longer he goes today, the more effective has been Scott Erickson. Two nothing, Baltimore after six. Somewhere lies the greatest of all trails. It has blue skies, gray skies, and black skies. It's made of rock. Mickey Mantle even stayed there. Recently restored to its former glory, and Jimmy Buffett and many of the musicians are staying there and have been uh, working with their Cuban uh, musical brothers. Doctors stayed there during spring training. It came down with Jackie Robinson back in 1947. Don Newcomb, Roy Campanella. Jackie Robinson and Campanella and those guys, though, did not stay with the rest of the team. And even in Cuba, but it was, no, but it wasn't the Cubans. It was the Dodgers who did that. It had nothing to do with the Cuban people not letting them stay there. But, but they had they had some of the same stuff going on here. Separate facilities, separate hotels. Two strikes to count to Willis Otanias. He is twice grounded out. And he is down on strikes. And Contreras has six strikeouts in four in the third innings. He's only allowed one hit. Well, they said that he had the best stuff of any of the Cuban pitchers, and here's the high fastball, and he just throws it right by Otonias, and not much that he can do with it. But they've said that he has the best stuff of any of the Cuban pitchers, and we're seeing that. I'm a believer. Yeah. Charles Johnson has driven in the only runs of the day. Two nothing, Baltimore ahead on Johnson's two run second inning homer. Right field, Vido. And that is out number two. They all said, said that he was the money pitcher here in Cuba. He's the guy that you want on the mound. And the money's on the line. And speaking of that, John, behind the third base dugouts and behind the bleachers there at third base, they have a little area where they wager, you know, chickens and other things, you know, on the ball games, and they call it Wall Street. <laughs> yeah, right behind, right behind the bleachers there. It's called Wall Street. Well, there's a long tradition of uh, wagering going on during ball games here at the Estadio Latino Americano. Rebele retired. Another quick inning for Contreras. Two nothing Baltimore after six and a half. Ambos Mundos, where Ernest Hemingway worked in his famous novel For Whom the Bell Tolls. Hey, a little salsa going out there, John. We're getting into it a little bit out there now. Yeah. Hemingway, uh, by the way, lived in Cuba for around 30 years as Andy Morales, the fifth place hitter, leads off, takes a strike. His, uh, his writings are still required reading in Cuban schools, and he's been thought to be the second most widely read author in Cuba after the uh, Patriot, Jose Martí. That's a broken bat base hit to right by Morales, his second hit. First time since the first inning that Cuba has gotten its leadoff man aboard. The Orioles made a couple of changes, by the way, defensively. Well, that's a sinker away, and he hits it off the end of the bat, and it drops in front of Albert Bell in right field. So Morales has the third, actually the fourth base hit for the Cuban team. Changes for the Orioles, as you saw Jeff Reveille now at third base. And uh, in at second base is Jesse Garcia. Otanias is out of the game. The Oriole bullpen is busy for the first time. As Loidel Chapeyi, who has walked and hit into a force play, has a count of 0 and 2 now. There's the right-hander. 
Mike Fetters and the left-hander Arthur Rhodes in the Baltimore bullpen. Elrod Hendricks, number 44, the longtime Baltimore fixture, the bullpen coach now. In the background, one ball, two strikes. Robert Kiesby, though, is on deck. Two nothing. The Orioles with the lead. Scott Erickson, by the way, working in the seventh inning, is now at 74 pitches thrown. So he should be all right. But he's also getting the ball up as he tries to get Chapel Yee to hit a ground ball for a double play. Every pitch has been up. Always sort of a telltale sign. Yeah, especially for a sinker ball pitcher. Runner at first, Morales back to the bag as Erickson looked him back. One man on, nobody out, seventh inning. The Orioles lead Cuba 2 0. Bought it. Got him. Safe in at second in the play, Morales. Champagne met that headlong dive. Now, last night when we were here, Joe, everybody was making a headline dive of some kind. Well, that's the effort that they put into the game. I mean, they go all out trying to make catches in the outfield, trying to beat throws to the infield. As you see, Bordick makes a fine play. And there you see Chapel Yee run into the bag and then diving. He just hustles down the line and he says, well, maybe I can beat it. He makes a dive, but he's still out. Runner at second is the crowd for the first time in a long while. Starts to get into it a little bit here. Robert Kiesby, though, the right fielder. The seventh place hitter. He is 0 for 2 and he takes ball one from Erickson. But you know, every time I see a guy make a head first dive at first like that, Joe, I always remember the words of Cal Ripken Sr., who taught base running to many generations of Orioles young players. And he hated to see that. Well, it's but it slowed you down. It's not a good play. You have to run through the bag, not to the bag. And when you slide like that, you're sliding to the bag. And you have to slow down to dive. One ball, one strike to Vido. Out of play down the left field line. Estadio Latino Americano coming alive here in Havana. Well, I think if, if Scott Eric can, can get out of this inning, this will probably be his last inning because he is showing some signs that maybe he is tiring a little bit. He had gotten on top of his game the last three innings, but he's struggling here in the seventh. Sinker misses. Two balls, two strikes. Well, I mean, he's into the seventh inning for the first time this spring. He would have one more start in Florida before he would make his first regular season start. Up the middle. Base hit. Morales will score. Cuba has its first run against the Major League Orioles. They do everything here. They get excited over their baseball. Nido got the base hit. And as Morales came around to score, it wasn't even a play at the plate, but he made a slide and a pickup. As you see the ball go through, Morales comes. The throw goes into second base. They don't even have a throw to the plate, but watch him. He comes in, slides, and he's happy. And now a two to one ball game. And so is Fidel. And Ray Miller, who is not so happy, goes out to the mound now. As this uh, Cuban lineup, for one of the few times today, has brought this crowd alive, the uh, this invited crowd. Ray Miller out there with Erickson and Charles Johnson. His bullpen is busy. Is Miller's Hardiness, the first base coach with me though, who has the first RBI of the day for Cuba. Juan Manrique, the catcher, who has struck out twice against Erickson. The only two strikeouts recorded by Erickson will come up. And uh, I 
Let's take it back. We have a pinch hitter. Eduardo Cardenas is going to pinch hit. And he's a relative of Leo Cardenas, who played for the Cincinnati Reds. And he's, a, years. he's an excellent bunter. That's ball one. One out here with the possible tying on it first. Now Cardenas hit 361 in the regular season. But with no home runs, he's uh, apparently a, a, a singles type hitter. Not very big. He must be a pretty good hitter as well. 361 average. Two balls, no strikes. Leo Cardenas, an outstanding shortstop for the Reds for many years. Carlton Chico. There goes the runner. And a foul. Off the left field line. And back, back to the bag will go Bido. Good hit and run attempt there is you can see Carden is taking a shot toward left field and Bordick was covering it. One ball, or rather two balls, one strike to Manrique. He's the eighth, or rather the pinch hitter for Manrique. Cardinal. Armandito El Team Torero is uh, almost always here, apparently, at this ballpark, leading the cheers on top of the dugout with his whistle. Well, they even take him on road trips, John. He's become a part of their heritage here. They'll take him on the road when the, when the team goes on the road. Cardenas fouls another one away. Costs one peso to come to a baseball game here. And one peso is five cents in American dollars. I thought it was five pesos. One. Yeah, but yeah, one for the rest and three. If you want to sit behind the plate, it may be three. Oh, but three, the three rest three. of the seats are one peso. Right. I was a one peso guy. Yeah, you are. You're always and yeah, you're trying to talk them down from there. <laughs> two and two. There goes the runner. Johnson cannot get it out of his hand. Stolen base for Bido. Well, the ball bounced. It's short hop Johnson, and he tried to come up throwing, and he couldn't grab, get a good hold on it, so he wisely held on to the ball. Now watch. See, the ball bounces at home plate, and it threw his timing off, and he couldn't get a good grip, so he decided he better hold it, which was wise. Nice pickup by Johnson. I mean, if that ball had gotten past him, Vido might have gone to third. It's three and two to Cardenas. A base hit could tie the game. We're in the seventh inning. Garcia, out number two, and now Vido moves to third base. Moreno due up, the ninth place hitter. But Urquiola is going to go to his bench again. And Oscar Machado is going to be the pinch hitter. Machado with 322 in the regular season with six homers, 36 batted in. Cuba, by the way, just used its only left handed pinch hitter off the bench in Cardenas. There's ball one to Machado. If you're wondering how come there's not a left handed pinch hitter up here, well, there are. There are none. Cardenas was the only one. Ball one to Machado. A base hit could tie the game. Garcia high hop. And the side is retired. So Cuba gets one of them back. We're heading to the eighth inning. Top of the order for Baltimore. Two to one the Orioles lead. Two to one lead over Cuba. Ariel Pestano now the catcher for Cuba. Also a new shortstop is in there, Donnell Castro. The Orioles come up at the top of their order, Brady Anderson against Contreras. And that's ball one and two low. Brady has lined to right, been hit by a pitch and struck out looking. One of six strikeouts recorded by Contreras in five innings pitch. He has allowed only one hit since he came into the game back in the third inning. One ball, one strike. That was a good pitch for Brady to hit a slider. That 
hung over the middle of the plate and he missed it. And my scorecard just went down into the crowd. Someone has a souvenir. One ball, one strike to Brady. Strike two over the outside. And the best to win took Joe's scorecard right out of our broadcast location here. Didn't I tell you to keep that anchor down? Yeah, and, and you know what? I did have an anchor down until then. <laughs> you were so busy thinking about your next uh, cigarro and your next mojito. <laughs> You've got to concentrate, Joe. One and two. Down the right field line. Bido into the corner. That's a fair ball, and it bounces up and out of play. An automatic double. Just barely fair into that right field corner. The second extra base hit of the game. Johnson had a home run for the Orioles' two runs back in the second. And actually, the Cuban team has out hit the Orioles five to four. That's the fourth base hit for the Orioles. He tried a fastball. He wanted to run it, started off the plate inside and run it back over, but he started it on the inside corner and moved out over the plate, and Brady was able to handle this one. He struck him out with a fastball on the inside corner his last time at bat. And the Cuba bullpen is going now. Only the second hit for the Orioles against Contreras. The batter is boarded. There is Pedro Luis Lasso. Slider for a strike as Bordick showed bunt pulled back. And Lasso's their guy. I mean, he's their their closer, and he's the guy that can come in and shut the Orioles down if they're able to get, you know, back in this ball game. They're already in it if they can get a lead. Big hard thrower. The Orioles trying to get that run back. Their lead is only two to one in the eighth inning. Bordick is one for three in the game. Trying to get Anderson over to third. That's his job. Second place hitter with a runner at second over there. He's got to get him over. Anderson with a big lead. That's strike two call. Good idea there by Bordig because the third baseman, Linares, was back deep. He could have dropped that one down. He might have even gotten a base hit out of it. Now usually you think of a low pitch like as a good pitch to bunt. It is a good pitch to bunt. You definitely do not want to bunt the high pitch. The high fastball, you pop it up. Oh, and to the count, but Bordick, I guess, thought it was out of the strike zone, so he took it. Now he's in a hole. And Linares has backed up at third in the first baseman. Tapayi is backed up. Look down. Hello. One ball, two strikes. Contreras is known to be a guy that will come off the plate inside and 0 and 2 is a good time to do it. And that's apparently not all that typical in Cuba perhaps because just like in American intercollegiate baseball all these years with the aluminum bats you don't always get the reward for coming inside with the aluminum bat. He jammed him. That's a foul ball. Quickly Pistano out to get it but it was foul. Good pitch there as he came inside. Bordick would like the ball out over the plate where he can maybe even slap it to the right side and move Anderson along. But watch this fastball runs well in on him. He just handcuffs him. He fights it off. And that's a good job by Bordick to fight it off. You see Contreras numbers and he has really been something. Five innings plus. Only two hits allowed. No runs. Two walks. Six strikeouts since he came out. The starting pitcher Jose Ibar. Gave up the two run homer to Johnson in the second. Now we're in the eighth, and those are still the only two runs for Baltimore today. Have a threat now. Will Clark on deck. Anderson at second. Nobody out. Trying to go to the right side of that slider. Chapayi can't get to it. Well, we knew that their pitching was capable of holding the Orioles down. You know, if you pitch your two best pitchers, the whole legs back to back you should be able to hold the team down and that's basically what they're doing here. Well Joe you mentioned at the very outset of the telecast if Alfonso Urquiola's Cuban all-star team could keep it a low scoring game they'd have their shot right. and the pitches have kept it low scoring. 
Two to one. Baltimore clinging to the lead. But the strike three. He went around with it. That was a smart pitch. Up and out of the strike zone. He knows that Bordick wants to wait a little while, a little longer, and slap the ball the other way. But you can see that pitch is up and in. Perfect spot. Well, that's twice now that Bordick has gone down to that high pitch. Opening day for Major League Baseball a week from tomorrow after our Sunday night opener from Monterey, Mexico. We'll start off with a triple ahead of the Arizona Diamondbacks and the Dodgers could be Randy Johnson and Kevin Brown at 4 Eastern. Then the Milwaukee Brewers take on Mark McGuire and the Cardinals in St. Louis. Big Mac, can he do it again? It gets started at 7 Eastern from St. Louis. Then the world champion Yankees open up with Roger Clemens most likely in the mound at the Oakland Coliseum. This is the it. Athletics. This is interesting, John. They're going to walk Will Clark and try to get a double play out of Albert Bell. Well, there's play in the book, and then there's yeah, and then there's playing with fire. Buddy Contreras has been able to handle Bell in his previous two at bat, so they figure they have a better shot there. Well, managers in the United States like to go by the numbers. Albert Bell has never even hit a fair ball against Contreras. <laughs> Albert has struck out twice in a row, but as we mentioned earlier, Joan, and as you've often pointed out, Albert is a hitter who makes his adjustments. Right. As Urquiola comes out to talk to Contreras, two men out, one man out, and the dangerous Albert Bell coming up. I mean, it would be it would be a, a, a shock to see Albert go down again to Contreras, at least by strikeout. But he made him look bad a couple of times chasing that low slider. Well, this is also a, hey, this is a challenge to Albert Bell. I mean, you're, they've just issued a challenge. Albert's not used to having people walked in front of him to get to him. And you can see uh, Contreras is very confident that he can get him out. But I would bet that Albert Bell will have a couple of good swings at him in this at bat. It may only take one, but I think Albert will make some adjustments. But when we'll just see if Contreras makes any, see if he pitches him the same way. An adjustment, that's the word. Albert's seen him twice now. Two men on, one man out. Albert is 0 for 3 today. He swung, says the plate umpire Nelson Diaz, and Albert didn't think so. Well, I think Albert was looking for that slider, and Contreras threw it. And he, after, by the time he realized it wasn't going to be in the strike zone, it was too late. You'll see that he does commit on this pitch. Watch the head of the bat. Right there, and then he pulls it back. You know, that little disagreement was conspicuous by the fact that we had just haven't seen those kind of disagreements today. Linares gets one. Back to first. Off the bag, but in time. Chepa Yee got back to the bag. It's an inning ending double play. And Contreras has retired Albert Bell for the third consecutive time. The top of the order coming up for Cuba. Two to one, Baltimore. Next month, from Ferry 1946, it was simply known as uh, Gran Estadio, big stadium. And uh, there's been a lot of history here, and uh, more being written today as Major League Baseball returns to Cuba after a 40 year absence in the person of the Baltimore Orioles uh, ball club as Arthur Rhodes comes in from the Baltimore bullpen, hard throwing lefty. He's been become an outstanding reliever for the Orioles these last uh, three years. And he relieves Scott Erickson. Who went seven strong innings, allowing one run and five hits to Cuba? Rhodes will face the top of the batting order here in the eighth. Take a look at Albert Bell adjusting to Contreras. It's a pretty good pitch. He hits it hard, but he pulls it to the third baseman. It was a good pitch by Contreras and good swing into the bat there by Albert Bell. But he hit it right at the third baseman. Lenares turned it into a double play. Albert 0 for 4. He never got the ball out of the infield today against uh, Ibar and. Mostly against Contreras, who has been real impressive. Top of the order. Leadoff man Jose Estrada leads off here in the eighth. The bunt, it's gone. That's, that's a little long for a bunt. I mean, that would on that one. That'd have been fair. He would have gotten a double. <laughs> the one thing I've noticed about some of the Cuban players, they're adjusted to a wood bat, but most of them are down on the end of the bat. As Estrada is here, they're not choking up. You would think that you, if you're not going to hit for a lot of power, that you would choke up on the bat. And truthfully, if you choke up on the bat, that puts you back to where an aluminum bat is. You know, it's a light bat that you can swing a little faster, get a little more bat speed. 
two strikes. Rhodes, a real hard throw. You see again, 93 miles an hour. Wastes one there. One ball and two strikes. Two to one. Baltimore ahead. Last of the eighth. The Oriole bullpen busy, even as Rhodes goes to work here in the eighth. That is a fair ball. Estrada will stop at second with a leadoff double. This pitch is down. And you can see Estrada goes out and actually pulls it because the ball was away from him. Looked like it was a breaking ball, a curveball. He was a little bit out in front and he pulls it down the line fair. And they have a runner at second with no one out. And uh, the man who is reputed to be the best butter on this team, Luis Ulasia, at the plate to try and get him to third. Already showing bunt. And that will get it done nicely. Rebele throws him out. Estrada at third with only one out. Great job of bunting there by Velasia. I mean, this is just a great job. Watch him. Catches the ball out on the end of the bat, pushes it toward third base. Third baseman Bordick has to come in and get it. I'm Rebele, I'm sorry, doesn't have any other choice. Good job there. The Orioles are going to play the infield in again, which I think is the right play here. It's the eighth inning. It's two to one Orioles and the league leader with a chance to tie the game. Yobal Duenas. I mean, that's just power from off the roads. He blew it past him at his own one. Well, the thing, the reason he blew it past him, he got that pitch up a little bit. I think it, when you have teams, a team like the Cuban team, that's not used to the wooden bat. They cannot handle the high fastball. You can handle the low pitch with less bat speed. Duenas has not gotten the ball out of the infield today. He's 0 for 3. Holding at third is Estrada. And Garcia throws out Duenas. And that's the second time today that Duenas has come up with a runner at third and less than two outs. And he has not been able to get him home. I'm a little surprised at that one, except the fact that Lenares is up. I think he would have been able to score on that ball because the ball hit in front of the plate and bounced pretty high. And if you're going on contact, you might be able to make it. But by the same token, they've run themselves out of an inning in the first inning. They don't want to do that again. Yeah. And Ray Miller is truly playing this as if he wants to win. He's going to bring a right-hander in to pitch to Lenares. He's got his closer. Mike Timlin, the new Baltimore closer to face the legendary Omar Linares when we come back. Derek Jeter, All-Star, World Series champion. What's his secret? Inside Scoop went looking. And we found out. You got me. Last year, Derek trained with All-Star Baseball and the Yankees went all the way. This year. And Linares with a big cut. Yeah, he wasn't trying to hit a single to get Estrada in from third. He was trying to drive himself in. Now he walks all the way back over to change bats. He's going to change bats. That bat had a hole in it. Yeah. <laughs> now this would not be allowed in the major league. No, I think he's going to get a lighter bat. 20. Ordinarily, you'd see a, a bat all treated and smeared up with pine tar. Help a guy get the, the grip on it. They don't have pine tar here. Yeah, but the gloves are supposed to replace the pine tar. I mean, in the old days, they didn't have gloves. They didn't use batting gloves. They just used, uh, you know, you didn't have any batting gloves, so you just had your hand on the bat. That's when you needed the pine tar the most. But remember, Linares, all of those home runs were hit with an aluminum bat. Runner at third, two down. Plus, they also have tape on the bats here that helps you get a grip. That's what I was wondering why most of them, if you do not feel comfortable with it, have more tape on the bat. See, this bat has tape on it so you can get a better grip. Estrada at third, two down. And it goes to two strikes in a ball to Linares. Let's go to Alvaro Martin. Gentlemen, the uh, bats they use are Louisville Sluggers and Adirondacks brought here by, uh, by a Houston promoter a few months ago. They do not have pine tar. They're using this 
chalk or this spray that dries out and becomes chalk that gymnasts use to prepare for uh, Olympic competition. All right. First of all, John, pine tar is overrated anyway. <laughs> and it's so messy. Yeah, they didn't have pine tar when, you know, Jackie Robinson played. They didn't have pine tar when Ted Williams played. Look out. It spins him out of there. Two balls, two strikes. The Naros, who's been playing in the top Cuban league since he was 15 years old. A veteran of many, many an international contest. Two and two. Tried the breaking ball and uh, it didn't do it. Three and two. Andy Morales on deck. He would be next. And Morales is considered the heir apparent to the third base job on the national team when Lenaris retires. Yeah, it is foul. Came right after him. Well, I think you have to right here if you're Timlin, you have to say, hey, I'm going to throw my best pitch. I'm going to let the fastball go. He tried to throw the splitter when he got two strikes on him and he missed with it. Now you just have to say, okay, let's see if he can handle my best fastball. Cuba trying to get the possible tying run home. Trying to get the tying run home. Estrada at third, two down, three and two the count. Base hit. It's tied in Havana. Another moment of greatness for the great one, El Nino, Omar Linares. Well, he tried another fastball, and I think that was the right play. He even got it in a pretty good spot. That fastball was up and in, but Lenares was able to handle it. And that's why he's a good hitter. His first hit of the game has driven in the tying run. Watch this pitch. Fastball up and in, and he's able to handle it. Good job of hitting there by Lenares. Now, Andy Morales. And, Joe, you mentioned correctly, I mean, he's the heir apparent at third base. At 363 this year. And watch this ball just under the dive of Revelé. He just could not quite get there. And we're tied. And you see Estrada comes home with the tying run and Lenaris over to first. Two There's strikes. Splitter. Now ordinarily that would have been Cal Ripken at third base. And Oreo fans might want to believe that Cal would have gotten to that one. That was hit awfully hard. I don't think that was a defensive lap. That ball was ripped in the left field. Well, Marlin Aris, so many great moments for the Cuban national team. And that's a ball out here. And you know, Joe, I mean, we've heard about him for so many years. And this is has to be just a huge day for him to try and, and show the major leaguers what he's all about. But well, what I find interesting, John, he hit the ball to the right side all the, his three, three previous at bats. They tried to come up and in, and he pulled it. One and two to Morales. Morales, 363 during the season, as I mentioned, had 17 home runs and 71 RBIs during their 90 game season. Today, he is two for three, including an infield hit. Two to two in the eighth inning. And the strikeout for Timlin. But Omar Linares has driven in the tying run. BJ Serhoff coming up. It's 2 2. Cuban all time home run leader drove in the tying run with this two out single to left. And Joe, I think he felt the excitement of the moment after getting to first base with the single. Here's his reaction. Yeah. And there is Fidel Linares, the father of Omar Linares, and himself a great star for Pinar del Rio years ago. The, uh, the team that uh, manager Urquiola managed this year in the Cuban League. And he's also managing the team today. And we'll have to see if Contreras has a lot left. This is his seventh inning of work. He's been something. B.J. Surhoff takes a strike. One ball, one strike. Now Surhoff questions that call from Nelson Diaz. As did Albert Bell on a uh, check swing that was ruled a, a swing in the previous inning. Surhoff is one for two with a walk. He has scored a run. Uh, 
Lassia. One away. Open activity for Cuba, meanwhile. As Contreras continues to mow down the Orioles, the right-hander there, Miles Rodriguez, number 44, to the left of the screen, and also the big right-hander on the right of the screen, that is Pedro Luis Lasso. Big, hard-throwing right-hander. Harold Baines didn't look bad on that changeup. Well, Contreras has done it basically with a good, hard fastball. Now he throws him an off-speed pitch. And Baines way out in front. That's 81 pitches thrown by Contreras since he came in in relief. Fastball. One ball, one strike. Well, the fans thought it was a strike. Baines has grounded out three times in this game. The Orioles have not scored since the second inning when Charles Johnson hit a two-run homer. And they only have four base hits in this ball game. One ball and two strike. Now, also, one difference. The Orioles, remember, are in spring training, getting ready for the regular season. The regular season has just ended here in Cuba. So Contreras has a full season of pitching already behind him. The fourth ball for the strikeout. And he's got eight strikeouts in six and two-third innings. And now you see why they said he is the best has the best stuff of all the Cuban pitchers. He sets Baines up with a slider running in. Now he turns this pitch over a fork ball. It goes down and away and Baines is completely fooled by it. Two sliders in and a fork ball away. Two to two in the ninth inning. 85 pitches for Contreras as the uh, second baseman. Freddy Garcia comes up now. Oh and one. Yeah, he's toying with him now. Oh and one the count to Garcia. Up for the first time in this game. Inside, but missing. Well, you can see the fans are in it now, and they're cheering on every pitch. One ball, one strike. Well, Joe, again, uh, we mentioned earlier, at the very top of the telecast, you thought Cuba's chance to win this game rested with its pitching to keep a tight, low-scoring game. They've done that, and they've been able to scratch out a couple of runs here late in the game to tie the Orioles. And the Orioles now are having to deal with a pitcher that they just can't touch. And remember, the Orioles only have four base hits in this ball game. Only two against Contreras in his seventh inning. One and two, the count. Struck him out. He has nine strikeouts in seven innings, and he has shut down the Major League Orioles. Cuba coming up, last of the ninth, we're tied. The Major League Base. The Orioles don't win this game. It'll certainly be considered an upset back home. And even here in Cuba, it was a really hot debate in many quarters among the, the, the fans as to whether Cuba would stand any kind of a chance at all against Baltimore. But their pitchers have certainly been up to the task that kept them in the ball game. And now they have a chance to win it here in the ninth inning in a 2 2 time. Uh, the Orioles have a couple of players out of that lineup, but I think you have to look at the fact and say, well, this lineup doesn't look real formidable without Cal Ripken in it, without Delano DeShields in this lineup. The Orioles are fielding today. Delano DeShields, who will he hit either first or second, and he certainly added that great dimension of speed and his ability to get on base at the top of the order. And of course, Ripken hoping to uh, rebound after probably his poorest year offensively last year. And have, having watched Cal all these years, it would be hard to bet against him. Here is Loidel Chapayi against Mike Timlin. There is ball one. The Baltimore bullpen is busy. Back at Timlin as we play the last of the night. There is 
the veteran reliever Jesse Orozco. That uh, breaking ball in there for a strike. One ball, one strike to Champagny, who is 0 for 2 with a walk. Robert Keys Bido is on deck, and then we'll see. There's a foul back to the screen. One ball and two strikes to Champagny. Champagny hit 314 in the regular season for Cuba. One thing we were told there were several of the biggest stars of Cuban baseball not available for this team for one reason or another. Either they're still playing in the, the postseason playoffs or have fallen in disfavor with the regime for whatever reason. Fallen in disfavor with Fidel as they foul back out of play. But we were also told in terms of the pitching staff that was another story. Most of the best pitchers are on this staff and we've seen a guy who certainly has to be one of the very best Jose Contreras who turned this game around. Seven shutout innings he came out when the club was down two nothing with the Orioles threatening to get more in the third. That's the strikeout for Timlin his second in a row. Next Sunday we hope you'll join us from Monterrey Mexico. Joe and I are sort of uh, doing our own ver version of barnstorming. <laughs> The Major League tradition of teams playing their way back north for the start of the season. We're we're working our way through the Caribbean and into Mexico on our way back north. Next Sunday night, eight o'clock Eastern, we'll be in Monterey, Mexico. Vinny Castilla goes home to Mexico. His Colorado Rockies take on Tony Gwynn of the Padres. We hope you'll join us then. Robert Kisby though, showing bunt. play two strikes the count to Bido. he drove in the first run for Cuba back in the seventh inning with a single to center field Cuba has only had one extra base hit amongst their seven total hits and that was a a hard low liner past third in this in the eighth inning by Estrada the leadoff man in Cuban baseball the, the style of play and, 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 and you, well, Alvaro Martin mentioned it earlier Joe you touched on it sort of a, a little ball style not a power game off the fists Rebele that's our number two and actually the style of play goes way back and was very reminiscent of uh, the style of play in the old Negro leagues from the United States who uh, brought a lot of their traditions down here They're a great influence on early uh, Cuban baseball early baseball in this century two down nobody on here is a Pestano the catcher up for the first time foul ball The Orioles got two in the second and have gotten none since. Shut down by Jose Contreras. Cuba got one in the seventh and one in the eighth. And now the Orioles are actually trying to get the game to extra innings. Timlin and Pestano is thrown out, and we are going to the tenth inning. We're not finished yet. Charles Johnson coming up for Baltimore. It is two to two. 40 years or since the Castro's revolution and the Orioles carrying the banner of Major League Baseball but they're in a battle now with this Cuban all-star team it is two to two don't forget now the fifth Nike hoop summit on ESPN the USA basketball junior national team will take on an international select team the US team comprised of top high school seniors in the nation the international team made up of top players 20 years old or younger at 3 o'clock Eastern following our ball game for more on that, log on to ESPN.com, part of the Go Network, Go.com. 
Charles Johnson leading it off back in the second. He got Baltimore on the board on a 3 0 pitch. But they have not scored since. He has walked and lined to right against Jose Contreras, who was not in the game when Johnson hit that home run against Ibar, the starter. That was the 90th pitch from Contreras. And I can just watch in Contreras' mannerisms. I think he's starting to tire a little bit. He just doesn't, I mean, I'm just watching him on the mound. His mannerisms tells me that, you know, he's pitched seven strong innings, but, you know, he's thrown a lot of pitches and under a lot of pressure. And he just seems to, you know, he does see he's taking a little more time, though, just the way he's walking around on the mound, not quite as confident as he was two innings ago. Two balls, no strikes to Johnson. And made a nice pitch there. Yes, he did. Two and one. Took a little off for the fastball. Well, as you see, Lasso, number 99, he's the big guy. Rodriguez, the other right hander. Lasso would be the guy that would be most likely to go to, I would think. Changed up again. Yeah, see, that's the point. He, that shows you how smart he is, though. He knows he doesn't have the same fastball he had. So he goes to a different pitch. Two changeups in a row to Charles Johnson. And now, quite naturally, he gets Charles mind thinking change up. He should come with something hard. We'll see how he throws, how he pitches. Two and two. One hop to short. Castro. Uh, number one. Looks like a little slider there, not a fastball. So one man gone here in the Orioles' tenth inning, and Jeff Revelle will come up. And one thing to keep in mind here, because the regular season ended three weeks ago, it's been a while since Contreras pitched in a game. I mean, he'd been pitching in this uh, camp, you know, with the the All Stars, but so he would perhaps not have his normal strength and durability, as if this were still in the middle of the season. Revelle shows Buck the only. High. The only good point for him is, you know, this is his last game. You know, the season is over. They're not in the playoffs, so the season is over. His team is not in the playoffs. Although they're supposed to send a team up to Baltimore May the 3rd. I've heard that rumor. So a, uh, return engagement. Ooh. Fastball called ball two. And I don't think. Contreras was very happy with Nelson Diaz call there. Well he kind of flops his arm open like where was it. Two and oh to Rebele. Oh, another two and oh breaking ball. He's doing the, something very similar here with Rebele that he did to Charles Johnson after getting behind two and oh. And that shows that he does have a, a good command of how to pitch he knows exactly how to pitch and he has good command of his pitches but he can go to a secondary pitch when he feels like his fastball is not as good as it was earlier and they're helping him out yeah that's for sure well they swung they swung it after getting ahead of the count two and oh they swung it like three bad pitches and in this case butter at a bad pitch and maybe that's a little different that you know you see in a major league team, they're sitting on a pitch looking for a fastball to drive it, and he throws them something different. They still swing at it. That might have been the uh, the splitter there, the bounce in the dirt. Three and two. Baltimore bullpen busy. We're in the top of the tenth inning. In the Cuba half of the tenth, the ninth place hitter scheduled to lead it off, Castro, and then to the top of the order. Estrada and Ulasia. And that's a walk for Revelle. So he ends up getting himself aboard against Contreras, who may well be tiring as Brady Anderson was a dangerous hitter with power. Fidel, along with the baseball commissioner. Bud Sealing, the owner of the Orioles, Peter Angelos, right down behind home plate, behind the backstop. And also on the right-hand side of the screen, the mayor of Baltimore, Kurt Schmoke, who made the trip. 
Kurt Schmoke is uh, attempting to work out a few uh, exchange type programs while here in Cuba for the next few days. One ball and no strikes to Brady Anderson, who is one for three. He doubled in the eighth inning, drove one deep into the right field corner. Well, one thing you can't do if your Contreras is continue to pitch behind, you know, major league hitters because it only takes one mistake and they can make you pay for it. He, he's continually falling behind each hitter here in the tenth inning. Uh, Urquiola, the manager, the manager of Pinar del Rio, and Contreras was one of his ace pitchers. So he knows Contreras well and seems to have a lot of faith in him, even though the big guy seems to be to tiring here in the 10th inning. Well, they said he is the big money pitcher. He's the big man. You know, he's the guy you want out there if the game is on the line, and I guess they're going to stay with him. Two balls, no strikes to Brady Anderson. Now, he, this is the third consecutive hitter he's gone to 2 and 0 with. He's made great pitches on this pitch to the first two batters here. That is in for a strike, but Brady, unlike his predecessors, very patient on it. Alvaro Martin is with us. Alvaro? John, the uh, weakness of Urquiola from the Cuban baseball insiders, he tends to hang on to his pitchers and, and let them out for the one more at bat than perhaps he should. So we need to keep an eye on that. There's a limit to a, the number of pitches that a pitcher can throw in the regular season in Cuba. That's 125. During the playoffs and international play, that does not apply. All right. Well, that, and uh, we didn't know that. That's very good information. Thank you, Alvaro. Good fastball. Two and two. Well, that's the best, best fastball he's thrown in quite a while, 91 miles an hour. Alvaro Martin, by the way, our colleague for today's game, is the uh, baseball commentator for ESPN International. I'm glad to have him with us here today in Cuba. Two and two to Brady Anderson. One out, Rebele at first, a 2 2 tie, 10th inning. And that's 10 for Contreras. And that's an excellent job. He, he got behind Brady Anderson 2-0. Oh, he hit the inside corner with a fastball. He went back away with another fastball for 2-2. Two and, two, and then he comes with an off-speed pitch. And Brady was sitting on a fastball. He's way out in front. Good pitching. That's the 105th pitch of the day for Contreras. And maybe... Erker Olaf knows his pitchers better than anyone else. He knows that this guy can reach back and get something extra. And he also, I guess, knows that he knows how to pitch even when he doesn't have his best stuff. Well, that's uh, an old baseball truism. The great one's able to do that. Here's Mike Bordick. Two down. Reveille at first. Bordick, one for four. Will Clark would be next. It's a big at bat here if Bordick could extend the inning, give the Orioles a chance with one of their best hitters. To try and make something out of this. Again, he starts behind the hitter, the fourth consecutive hitter of the inning. And the first baseman continues to talk to the catcher, like, hey, man, throw him some fastballs. He's not seem to have that confidence in the fastball now. the fastball but he missed badly with it up and in two balls no strikes Contreras in seven and two third innings pitched has allowed two hits and no runs he has ten strikeouts he has walked four, although one of those was intentionally there are his numbers two to two tenth inning three and oh Nike Hoops Summit, don't forget, will follow this game. So stay tuned for that if you've tuned in. They're supposed to have started a few minutes ago. Right now we're in extra innings in Havana, Cuba. The Baltimore Orioles representing Major League Baseball, playing a, a team of Cuban All-Stars in the first visit by a Major League team in four decades to Cuba. I don't think Bordick will be swinging here with Will Clark on deck. And he takes a strike for him. He looks down at Sam Perlazzo, the third base coach. 
There's Will Clark hoping to bat. He is on deck. Mike Bordick has had a fine spring for Baltimore. Rebele at first. Two down. He's running. Strike two. And he's out. Perfect throw by Pestano. Cuba with Castro, Estrada, and Ulasia tied at two. Uh, uh, Fidel, baseball seems to be everywhere. Uh, a vacant lot here, an empty field there. And where they're not playing, they're talking baseball, such as at Esquina Caliente, Joe Morgan's favorite <laughs> gathering place when he's in Havana. Two to two as we go to the last of the tenth inning. And as Fidel now has 40 years of as leader for life here in Cuba. Now at 72 years of age. There are some who say that extra innings is a good term also for Fidel's regime here in Cuba. Mike Fetters, the new pitcher for the Orioles as we play the last of the tenth inning. Donnell Castro up for the first time. He's got a base hit. And we go to the top of the batting order. We want to send our special thanks to our ESPN production crew who have overcome some great logistical obstacles to help uh, bring you this telecast today. Our special thanks to our operations producers, Wendell Grigley, Bruce Dumas, and Linda Chapley. Uh, a job done extremely well under great duress at times. And also, we want to tell you that today's telecast is a joint production between ESPN and the, uh, the Cuban Television Network. And that's a called strike on the outside to Estrada working side by side and uh, some of our cameras and some of their cameras are joining together for this telecast today. Showing bunt taking a ball there was Estrada. He scored the tying run of the game of the eighth after hitting a leadoff double. And he is one for three with a walk. Tele Rebelde, the television network here in Cuba. Back to the bag at first is Castro. And Rebelde really got in close at third base. He was almost right on top of Estrada. Well, Estrada's job is to butt into the first base from Will Clark anyway. It's a foul. One and two. One ball, two strikes to Estrada. After him, Luis Ulasia. After Ulasia, you've got the league's leading hitter from this year, Duenas, and then Linares. Showing bunt with a count of one and two. Now, I think he's going to think he was. Does he think he was bluffing? Well, I think he wanted to find out, but I, I really think he's going to bunt. Pulls away. Off the outside, two and two. You see how hard Rebele was charging in from third. Urquiola, the manager of Pinal del Rio, hollering out at Estrada, his leadoff man. Estrada backs away now. Well, I think he just gave it away. I don't think he's going to be up there bunting if he's trying to get a better grip on the bat. <laughs> Now again, they don't have the pine chart here. This is yeah, but that that uh, that I see what they're using, John. It's it's like uh, uh, some kind of a wax, and it rubs on and it becomes tacky. I've well, I've used that myself. Alvaro said it was uh, the kind of stuff they use in the, the gymnast shoes. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a little tacky. I've, I've used it myself. The <laughs> foul ball, so it's a strikeout. He bunted foul for strike three. So. Estrada unable to get the job done. And like a lot of hitters when they're trying to bunt and punching at the ball. You have to put 
put the barrel to the bat out there and catch it. Put the barrel out front. So you didn't like his style a whole no. lot there. Here is Ulasia. Ulasia, we saw him bunt early. He has a better bunting style in that he catches the barrel, the ball on the barrel of the bat. He helps set up the tying run with a beautiful bunt back in the eighth inning. And he's the guy they would rather have had up there bunting just now. He's reputed to be the best butter in Cuba, or at least on this team. One ball, one strike from Mike Fetters, another newcomer to the Orioles bullpen. A vastly reworked bullpen for the last couple of years. There goes the runner. Base hit to the wide open left side. Castro stops at second. Serhawk really hustled into that one. Well, the one thing the outfield for the Orioles should be doing anyway is playing in shallow. First of all, the wind is blowing in, and no one has showed us that they can drive the ball. And therefore, if you play in shallow, you'll have a shot at some of these base runners. Good job there by Ulasio in that he hits the vacant hole vacated there at shortstop on the hit and run. But as you mentioned, hustling in was Serhoff to hold him at second base. But the entire outfield, in my opinion, should be playing more shallow than they are because these guys are not driving the ball. Here's Yobal Duenas, the batting champion of Cuba. Just off the outside. Feder did not like that call. That looked pretty good. Slider to the outside. One ball and no strikes. Duenas hit a real hefty 418. But he has not gotten the ball out of the infield today. He's 0 for 4. The splitter. One ball, one strike. You know, you get in the habits as major league players of playing at a certain depth. But I believe that with the wind blowing in and with these guys not able to drive the ball, in this situation with the winning run at second base, you should be playing way in. There has not been a deep fly ball not hit by a Cuban batter all day. Right. So you should play it way in and give yourself a chance to throw a runner out at the plate in case there's a base hit in front of you. There have been only three fly balls to the outfield right. hit by Cuban hitters all day long. All of them routine. Chase that slider, bouncing it foul. One ball and two strikes now to Duenas with Omar Linares on deck. But the trouble is that, you know, in Major League players, they get accustomed to playing certain depth, you know, in certain situations. And so they're playing where they would normally play in this situation. I think you have to take the elements into it account and the fact that these guys are not driving the ball and come in on top of it. One and two. Two men on. Castro at second, the possible winning run. Struck him out with the splitter. And that leaves it to Linares. And that's only fitting, John. I mean, he's a legend here. That's, that's what you want. The legend wants to have a chance to win it for the home team. He tied it with a two out base hit. Now he has a chance to win it with a two out base hit. Back in the eighth inning with two down. That was the base hit from Linares that tied the game. And now he's looking for an even bigger hit. One ball, no strikes. The one thing that I've been impressed with is the way that he goes with the pitch. He's hit three balls to the right side on pitches out over the plate. They tried to come in and he pulled it. Let's see what he does here and see how they try to pitch him. I think they're going to stay away if they can. And the crowd here at Estadio Latino Americano trying to inspire Linares. It is 2 0. And you see, they are trying to stay away from him. Well, now he's put himself in a big hole, though, Joe. Well, not really, John, because you say to yourself, <laughs> there are two outs. I just, if I miss him, I get the next hitter. That's the way you have to look at it. You don't, you have, you don't have to end the inning with Lenares. Two and oh. Man, slider. he hung that one in there, didn't he? Yeah, a little slider. But I think Lenares is a very smart hitter, and I think he realized they were pitching him away. He's probably looking for something away. I was going to hit it to right field. They came off the plate with a slider off the plate and then it broke over the inside corner. Two and one. And the splitter tried to launch it. Two and two. Well, I think he was really fooled with the pitch, so he ended up taking a bigger swing than he normally would have. 
And watch, I think he was just going to swing, then he was fooled by it, so he just let it all go. Two on, two out, tenth inning. Popped up. Bordick. Now the Orioles will have their power coming up. Bordick and then Will Clark and Albert Bell. Two to two after ten in Havana. Stay with us. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan. And the Orioles will have some of the top hitters coming up in this inning. Now remember, stay tuned right after the ball game for the fifth Nike Hoops Summit on ESPN. The USA Basketball Junior National Team plays an international select team. High school seniors from the U.S. against top players 20 years of age or younger from around the world. That's coming up right after the ball game on ESPN. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Part of the Go Network. Go.com. And there have been some scouts who have seen this guy, Joe, from the major leagues. Uh, that uh, would compare him to uh, a young Lee Smith big hard throwing closer this guy Pedro Lasso is a starting pitcher here but they think he could be a closer and this is uh, some scouts have talked about it they think he could be a closer in the big leagues right now Pedro Luis Lasso Jose Contreras, I mean, what an outing for this guy. Yeah, just fantastic. But like I said, they kept telling me all week that he was the money pitcher. He's the man with the game on the line. And he's proved that today coming in and pitching after Jose Ebar gave up the two run homer to Charles Johnson. He shut the Orioles out the rest of the way. Here's Mike Bordick, one for four. And the slider misses, one ball and no strikes. Will Clark and Albert Bell will follow. Two to two in the eleventh inning. And the slider very high. Two balls and no strikes. But Joe, I suppose, with Contreras doing so well and with that reputation of being the money pitcher, if you go to the hot corner and meet up with your buddies there and talk some baseball after this game, they'll be second guessing the manager, Urquiola, for not starting Contreras in the first place. Good point. I guarantee you that will be a hot topic tomorrow. <laughs> At the hot corner. Jose Ibar, who, I mean, he went 18 and 2 this year, got the start, but he gave up a two run homer to Charles Johnson in the second inning. Contreras then came in and pitched eight shutout innings. Three and one. And look there, they're probably already arguing about who should have started this game now, Joe. <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking. Well, smart kid, though, he's got a Reds hat on. Back to the screen. Three and two. Jose Contreras, he was nine and three in the regular season. Remember, apparently in an angry moment after a game that didn't go so well, he punched a fence or a wall and broke his knuckle. Put him on the shelf for a month. Strike three call on the outside. And Bordick thought it was ball four. Not so sure he thought it was ball four, John, except he couldn't hit it. The balls were all inside before. Now this pitch here is away. And when you're when he when a pitcher throws you five or six pitches in a row inside, you have unconsciously you start to look inside. And that pitch was away. He was hoping it was ball four. Now Will Clark. One out, nobody on. Will Clark and Albert Bell. Neither one has had a hit. Combined 0 for 6. Clark has walked twice. And only Will Clark among the two of them has got the ball to the, got the ball to the outfield. He had a, a deep fly ball to right in the third. He also struck out into a double play in the fifth. This has not been a game where hitters have been really aggressive against the pitchers, and part of it is with the fact that they're unfamiliar with each pitcher and what they throw. Yeah, it's been a, a lollipop there for a ball. 2-0. Uses that no wind up delivery. Will Clark had his first really healthy year last year with Texas in seven years. Just every year something seemed to happen to Will. Sometimes it was injuries that lingered from one year to the next. 
But last year he finally was able to put together a healthy year. Drove in over 100 runs with the Rangers. That's a ball up and away. And when he first came out with the San Francisco Giants with that sweet swing, he homered in his first major league game against Nolan Ryan at the Astrodome. A lot of people could see Hall of Fame credentials in Will Clark, but his health has been a problem. Over the outside of Will Clark. Look back at Nelson Diaz on that call. Three and two the count. Albert Bell on deck. I'd have to say that I think the Cuban umpire has done a pretty good job in this ball game. In fact, I think he's done an excellent job behind home plate. Very strong. I mean, and just the players' reactions themselves will tell you. There's very little controversy. That is off the glove of Chapayi. Clark is going to head for second. Vido. Offline and a great save to keep that one from going over into the bullpen by the shortstop Castro. It was kind of interesting there. John Linares was it standing at third base as if the play was coming to third base instead of backing up the play as the shortstop was doing. And Castro made a diving grab to keep that one from going to the bullpen. Fastball right in the middle of the plate and down a little bit in Will Clark's wheelhouse. He rips it. Chapelle could not come up with it. And Clark goes in the second with a double. See Clark there got on that pop up slide ready to take off until Castro made a headlong dive to snare that air and throw. That'll be scored as a double for Will Clark. It's Urquiola is trying to decide whether they're going to walk Albert Bell. This time they walk Will Clark to get to Bell last time. That raised a few eyebrows, not yeah. only up here, but BJ is on deck. All around He's a left-handed hitter. I think it raised a few eyebrows around Major League Baseball <laughs> when that happened. But it worked. Albert Bell hit into a double play. Well, Will Clark just got his first hit. And now Albert Bell looking for his, trying to drive in a go-ahead run in the 11th inning. One of the great RBI men in all of Major League Baseball. 152 RBIs last year for the White Sox. Slider misses. Albert has hit into a force play. He twice has struck out, and once he has grounded into an inning ending double play. But you never know when a guy like Albert's going to explode because, I mean, he just, if you make a mistake with him, he usually makes you pay for it. Slider spins over the inside for a strike. And that was a mistake. And Albert, I, I think he, he, I saw him clench his teeth after that. He was a little shocked that he took that one. He, that wasn't what he was looking for, but that was a pretty good pitch to hit. Watch this right there. Breaking ball starts above the belt and stays there pretty much. See, he's kind of upset. And he took that pitch. Two and one. 95 mile an hour heater. Two balls and a strike. I think if you're a hitter and you haven't faced a lot of pitchers, you do not know exactly what they're going to do in certain situations. Once you get the count in your favor, I think you have to sit on one pitch, whether that be a slider here or a fastball. I think you have to sit on that pitch and commit to that one pitch and do something with it. With the fastball, it's popped up foul. We're back out of play. I don't think he was committed to the fastball right there. And I that would have been the pitch I would be looking for. Two and one, I would look for the fastball right there in that situation. So maybe Albert he I'm, guessed himself. Yeah, he wasn't committed to it because he was a little late on it. See, now you can't commit to any one pitch. With two strikes, you just have to handle what you see. Well, they struck him out twice on low sliders down and away. But then he came, they got him out with a fastball in last time. So you don't know, he doesn't know exactly what they're thinking. Will Clark at second. The slider popped up foul and out of play. Sidearm slider. Yeah. 
two and two to Albert Bell. Albert was talking to himself there. He said so. I know he said fastball. I don't know if he said I thought that was a fastball or it looked like a fastball, but he said fastball. Crowd very quiet. With the big slugger at the plate. Came with a slider in the inside. And that was a hard slider. That the other slider that he fouled off wasn't. This is a hard slider. But you can see it is inside because it just moved just a little bit. It was, might have even been more like a cutter than a slider. And he's got first base open. So he could still risk going with the slider yeah, here to put him away. Three and two. Clark leads from second. One out. Slider. Linares from third. Heading for third is Will Clark. He makes it as Bell is out at first. And that's a good base running play there by Will Clark to get over to third base. You know, a lot of people say, well, I might as well stay at second with two outs, but no, that's not true. You put a lot more pressure on the defense if you're at third, and there are at least nine ways you can score from third base with two outs that you can't score from first. So he puts himself in much better scoring position by getting over to third base with two outs. And B.J. Surhoff now to try and bring him home. Baltimore two, Cuba two in the 11th inning. Now ordinarily, in a regular spring training game, as they're going to walk Surhoff intentionally with another left-handed hitter, Harold Baines, behind him. So they well, seem to be a bit more afraid of Surhoff than they are of Baines. That's true. Or they think that maybe because Baines has bad legs, he can't run if he hits a chopper someplace. So perhaps in other words if you're going to face a lefty anyway. Yeah you might as well face the one that doesn't run as well and B.J. runs pretty well so if he had a ball up the middle they wouldn't be able to throw him out. You put B.J. at first base if Harold chops one you got a chance to go for fourth at second or you have a chance to get Harold at first base. You know I, I don't know if it was last week or the week before Montreal played the Mets down in the Dominican Republic a couple of games and the, the, the last game went extra innings. And Jim Beatty, the general manager of the Expos, is on this trip, told the story that John Stearns came over to Felipe Alou and said, well, should we call it after 10 innings? You see Clark at third. And I Felipe, know his answer. Felipe said, no. I thank you. I we know that's his answer. These people in the Dominican expect this game to be played to a finish. And we didn't travel all this way for a tie. <laughs> I would, I would knew what, I knew what Felipe would answer on that. But then in the 11th inning, they made an announcement because the Mets were running out of pitchers. I had run out. So they announced that they were only going to play another inning or two because of uh, having to make a flight. They announced it in advance. But then uh, Fernando Seguinal had a two run homer from Montreal and made it academic anyway. Harold Baines. Base hit just out of the reach of Castro. And the Orioles have their first run since the second inning. And they have taken a three to two lead here in the 11th. And that backfires on them at least in their opinion I mean the fact that you walk BJ and Harold Bain gets a base hit well it's I mean it's awfully difficult to walk anybody to get to Harold Bain right Harold Bain is one of the best hitters you know to play the game in a long time I mean he's been a great hitter for a long period of time 2649 career hits for Harold Baines. Peter Angelos enjoying that a bit more than the uh, the local Hefe. What was the total? Two thousand. Two thousand six hundred forty nine base hits. He's done that before. Pitching change for Cuba. The Orioles lead three to two in the eleventh. We'll be right back. Time son of Tampa for El Duque. And uh, his uh, fellow countryman Jose Contreras. Meanwhile down here. His star shone brightly against the Baltimore Orioles. But after eight shutout innings, they went to the bullpen, did Cuba, and uh, the Orioles got through against Lasso for a run. And now here is Ernesto Guevara Ramos on to face Jesse Garcia. Very slender right handed. Two men on, Sirhoff at second, Baines at first. El Alambre, the wire. Was the nickname of Ernesto Guevara Ramos. Pretty good year, 13 and 5. He 
pitch for a team called Grana. The eastern part of the country. Two balls and no strikes. Jesse Garcia struck out his first time. Garcia from uh, Texas. He pitched, he played professionally since 1993. He was a 26th round draft choice, Joe. So this guy would never considered on the fast track of the big leagues, but he given a shot in the Orioles camp this spring has impressed his manager greatly. Stole 19 bases in the minor leagues last year, splitting his time between Rochester in Triple A and Bowie in Double A. Well, you know, drafting is not an exact science, and uh, certainly much less exact in baseball than any other right. sport. Nike Hoop Summit still to come on ESPN right after the ball game. The uh, top high school seniors in the United States against an international select team. Stay tuned for that. Well, the Nesto campus doesn't seem to be able to get the signs. Jesse Garcia finally had success with the bat last year, all through his minor league career. Good fielder, but not much hitting. But last year hit 283 at Bowie in Double A, and then 294 at Rochester. And Alambre missing three and zero. Charles Johnson is on deck. Sir Hoff at second, Baines at first. That is too low. He walked him on four pitches. The fans are, are not happy. So Charles Johnson, who had a home run in the second inning, will come up with the bases loaded here in the 11th with Baltimore leading three to two. Both bullpen still busy. So now Surhoff at third, Baines at second, or uh, rather uh, Garcia at first. And Guevara, Guevara Ramos out of the stretch. And fastball for a strike. Charles Johnson. I mean, he just had a nightmare year last year after being traded. He got off to a horrible start with the Dodgers, which was not good considering he was the man who replaced Mike Piazza. His first month with the Dodgers, he hit about 175. Ooh. He got a hanger there. Yeah, he got a hanger and he had he took a good swing at it. I could tell that was your ooh, a hanger. Yeah. Ooh, a hanger. Yeah, you're right. When I played with the Astros, the guy would throw a hanger about halfway, ball halfway to the plate. You could hear Enos Cabell in the line, in the dugout howling. Aye! <laughs> That never happened to you, did it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you fouled a hanger back? Yes. <laughs> and they put you in the Hall of Fame anyway? <laughs> That's up and in. One ball, two strikes. Next Sunday, 8 Eastern, the 1999 Major League season begins in Mexico for the first time. Colorado and San Diego. Joe and I will be there to kick off the 1999 season. That slider is ripped into center field. Estrada, remember the wind blowing in, and that ends the inning. So Baltimore gets just the one. Three to two, we go to the last of the 11. The Orioles on top. Man in the Sea was inspired by seaside villages such as Kohimar, where they honored his memory with a bus. And the locals celebrate the great writer's birthday every year by dousing the bus with a shot of whiskey. <laughs> Hemingway would have appreciated that. Estadio Latino Americano. The, uh, the Cuban baseball fans at large 
not allowed to come today. Only by invitation. By edict of Fidel. And uh, certainly it's been a different crowd than we saw here just yesterday for a playoff game in the Cuban League between Industriales and uh, Santiago de Cuba. But we certainly have had some excitement here today as the Cuban ball club has showed off some of that talent that we've heard so much about. And they're able to show it off against an actual big league ball club for the very first time. Jesse Orozco comes down to pitch now for the Orioles the fifth Baltimore pitcher of the day the, the veteran lefty trying to close it out Andy Morales who hit 363 in the regular season will lead it off he is two for four in this game the slider in there for a strike Jesse I mean maybe he'll pitch forever that was the, the title of Satchel, Satchel Pages autobiography and Jesse uh, like Satchel he, he just might keep doing it that one is drilled into the alleyway right center but there is Albert Bell one away and that's one of the best hit balls to the outfield by a Cuban hitter all day long and the interesting part third John is that even though it looked like that ball was drilled it really didn't drive you know if that would have been hit by say you know Albert Bell or one of the guys that's used to hitting with wood bats that ball would have had a little more zip on it because he hit it on the good part of the bat but a little lack of bat speed there is, is really what's hurt hurting them on to drive the ball and that's keeping them from driving although they've out hit the Orioles nine to six I believe they've only hit three home runs in the playoffs since right. they started using the wooden bats out of the ballpark there was also an inside the park home run and that's a lot of games two home runs in last night's game but this is uh, Michelle Abreu now pinch hitting for Chapayi. Chapayi was 0 for 3. With a walk. Abreu. Hit 293 with 11 home runs in the regular season. And that slider misses outside. Jesse Orozco will turn 42 in less than a month. And he's still out there. I mean, this guy, like his teammate Cal Ripken, is a, uh, a guy who suffers through his workouts religiously. 3 and 0. I use the word suffer, Joe. I can't imagine it, describing it any other way. <laughs> 3 0 to Abreu. It's a strike. Abreu, who played for Matanzas this year, only 23 years old. Robert Keys Vido, due up next. The Orioles are hugging the foul lines now, guarding against the extra base hit. And right through the hole in the right field, the base hit. Uh, two pinch hits and three pinch hit at bats for the Cuban uh, pinch hitters today. Pinch runner is going to go in at first base. The uh, top base dealer for Cuba, Enrique Diaz, goes in. There he is warming up as Abreu got his job done. Diaz stole 40 bases this year. And remember, they only play a 90 game season. So, Joe, he's in there to steal. A left hand on the mound. Well, we'll see if he's able to read Orozco and get a good jump and take off because you better have a good jump if you go and Charles Johnson is behind the plate. And the whole idea of stealing right now seems uh, very risky. Vido, the hitter. Vido takes a strike. He is one for four. He drove in the first Cuban run with a single to center in the seventh inning. Cuba has 10 hits in the game the Orioles only have six we're in the 11th Baltimore ahead three to two Clark on the bag at first with Diaz Orozco drives him back 
And if you're a base stealer, that's really what you want to see. You want to see his move it to first base at least once. And Orozco gave it to him. Now we'll see if he's able to read the difference between his move to first and his move to the plate. Long lead. Some of these have seen it all now. Right? Yeah. So if, now you were a great base dealer. Would you have had the read on this guy if you'd never seen him before by now? Well, you should, yes. If you, all you need, you should need is for him to throw to first base one time. And then you should be able to see the difference between that and his delivery to the plate. Foul ball. One ball and two strikes to Vido. Third base coach for Cuba, Danilo Valiente, with some signs. There he is. Diaz gets his lead from first. Will Clark kind of holding close. And this time, Orozco drives him back. That wasn't a bad move there from Orozco. That might freeze him for another pitch or two. And he had him flinching back to the bag yeah. that time. Well, that was a pretty good move the time before, the pitch before. Two and two. This one is not a good move because once your foot goes behind the rubber, you have to go to the plate. Garcia, nice, nice pickup. Just in time at second to get Diaz. Nice and throw. Diaz didn't think so. Well, they never think so. <laughs> but that was a well, the, the thing about it is just a great play. Garcia could have taken the easy play at first base after he made the stop, but he took the smart route, and that is to keep the tying run from getting in the scoring position. Excellent play there by Garcia. Now watch, he dies now. He was he made he made up his mind before the ball got there that he was going to second base. And it's not even a contest at first second base. I mean he's out by at least three feet. Why look at this. He's not even close to the bag yet. He made a bad slide actually. I mean he slid sideways. He didn't go straight I, in. I mean if he had slid straight in he would have made it yeah, I think. Yeah. Jesse Garcia showing why he has been honored as the Eastern League's best defensive second baseman two years in a row. And he's got another one. And the ball game is over. And Jesse Garcia with two sensational plays in a row to wrap up this ball game as Pistano keep that kid. I and mean those are two very nice plays. Now we all know why Ray Miller has been so impressed by Jesse Garcia two sensational plays consecutively to drive a stake through the hearts of the Cuban All Stars. I mean this is an excellent play to end the ball game but the one before this was even better because he had to think as well as react. <laughs> I hope he didn't take it personally. <laughs> so the Orioles out with their own receiving line of congratulations. Out between first and second base and now the the Cuban All Stars come out of the third base side dugout. This has uh, become a tradition in the the major leagues for the victorious team to congratulate itself in effect for a good game. But now in this uh, baseball exchange the two teams will again in a display of good sportsmanship congratulate one another for a game well played. They always do this in international competition. Next Sunday night, 8 o'clock Eastern, the Rockies and the Padres as the 1999 Major League season begins. Here in Havana, the Orioles and Major League Baseball score a win over Cuba, but not by much. John Miller for Joe Morgan. Thanks for tuning in. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports.